this is murder! Murder! You'll all be guilty! And you're doing it for nothing! Killing me won't bring back your goddamn honey! But I know it will. sixth episode this is the big one this is the one you have been waiting for hopefully of uh max and ruby which if you haven't already noticed is a podcast with slides where people talk about ruby with me max uh i am your host the red mage elden a double cast aka the los angeles department of gamer girl bathwater and nozomi power mm-hmm. i use any and all pronouns just whichever ones you want. You can find me on Twitter at DoubleCast, spelled with a five instead of an S. And on Tumblr right now, I am actually dancing stars on meme because it's October, and so I have a spooky seasonal URL. But uh, after Halloween, I'll probably be back to DoubleCast. So this is it's only temporary. I'm Erin, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, my Tumblr is 12Clara. You find me on Twitter at explosive underscore sky and on AO3 as explosive sky where i write for anyone looking to follow aaron on tumblr just know that uh url is vestigial there are no doctor who posts on that blog yes there are none of <laughs> I, <laughs> i'm margaret i use she her pronouns my twitter tumblr and ao3 is all pagoda do you have like a pug and a goat or was do you only have well, one I don't right have now the goat anymore but Aww. i do have the pugs okay gotcha no i'm just pug no, no goat <laughs> And thankfully, there is not another person named Pug on the podcast today. So there is, at the very least, no no confusion. Uh, I am Mercedes. I use she, her pronouns. You can find me on Twitter at Coffee Bees or on Tumblr at Lights Around Your Vanity. Lights around my vanity? It's more likely than you think. (laughs) You just think that every time. (laughs) Hi, I'm Wish. I go by she, her pronouns. Um, My Twitter and Instagram are Pixel Wishes and my Tumblr is Pixel Wishy. Um, I cosplay and shitpost and just do random things. I didn't think of a joke for Wish's username. Oh, well. (laughs) Fine. (sighs) Can't win them all. All right, let's just hop right into Errors No Missions, because this is going to be a long-ass episode. All right. First of all, uh, WordCubed responded to our conversation about uh, the fight at uh, Haven Academy not making any sense because people were fighting characters they had no connection to. In particular, we were complaining that Jean versus Cinder is kind of dumb. WordCube contended that that fight actually does make sense in the sense that uh, Jean is fighting to avenge Pyrrha, and Cinder was given specific instructions by Salem not to kill Ruby, so she can just fight whoever. so I don't know how satisfying that is for people, but that's one way to think about it. I mean, Cinder clearly didn't care. She's like, who are you? <laughs> and admittedly, that was very funny, so. Yeah, it's true. It was worth it for that, that line. Um, last episode, I was kind of talking out of my ass about uh, the concept that the volume five budget was severely hamstrung by uh, Rooster Teeth wasting a bunch of money on the character shorts. Um, And I didn't have a source for that, but uh, T. Green followed up to say that that was actually an issue with the Volume 5 budget, but there were actually a lot more issues with the Volume 5 budget as well. So many that it gets an entire slide in the discourse section this episode. So 
I hope everyone is looking forward to that. Totally. Mm. <laughs> uh, Hambone Fake Namington commented on the bonus episode I put up where we were talking about the uh, Nightmare, which was uh, the Ruby animation pipeline in the early volumes. Um, because I think I referred to the Rooster Teeth's audience prior to Ruby as being, uh, I think, quote, epic Call of Duty gamers, which, one, that's on me for being racist against people who play first-person shooters. Obviously, I cannot <laughs> conflate Call of Duty with Halo. They are two separate audiences. Just because I can't tell them apart doesn't mean everyone else can't. Um, but... More importantly, uh, Hambone pointed out that Rooster Teeth did have a female audience before Ruby started because a lot of uh, girls came to the company for Achievement Hunter, which picked up in, I think, 2011 or 2012. So a year or two before Ruby started, there was already a significant female audience for Rooster Teeth content. More importantly, Hambone Fake Namington is a great name. Oh, it's a fantastic username. Huge fan. Um, so yeah, that was... My bad. I'm just dumb and don't know when things happen. For some reason, I thought Achievement Hunter was, like, got big after Ruby. But that's just me not paying attention to Rooster Teeth. Um, BMW12399 responded to uh, a comment someone made, I forget who, about the headmaster at Shade Academy in the sense of, like, well, you know, uh, Leo is the Cowardly Lion, and Ironwood is the Tin Man, and Ozpin is the Wizard, so that means that the Headmaster at Shade should be the Scarecrow. Well, it turns out the Headmaster at Shade isn't the Scarecrow, because Crow is supposed to be the Scarecrow. Um, not sure how I feel about that. I guess, because the conceit there is, like, if I only had a brain, so I guess having a character who's just, like, sloshed all the time is, like, close enough. I guess. Um, but apparently, if you read the books, uh, the headmaster at Shade is heavily implied to be Dorothy. So well, that's like, yeah, basically all that confirms. Like he has like ruby slipper gloves and his name is like Theodore, which is like the word inverted of Dorothy. Mm. Ah, yeah. mm -hmm. Very clever. Very clever. And then finally, John Seymour didn't actually have a correction, but just pointed out, uh, and this was in all caps in the original comment, that Mahiru deserved better. And she did. She absolutely did. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch Review Starlight, because everyone should be required to watch Review Starlight. All right, volume six. We've been building up to this one a lot. There's, there's much to dissect here, much to unpack. Um, let's just go around real quick. Uh, what was everyone's overall impressions of this volume? Aaron. Oh, best of all time, perfect volume, everything I ever wanted come to fruition, um, would watch again 1,000 times in a row, 100 out of 100. Margaret? Yeah, my favorite volume. I, I, my favorite one for rewatches and it's, it's the best. Uh, Merck? Yeah, it's it's a great. It is my favorite volume as well, and it's I mean it's fantastic. And like beyond like the obvious, it's just I think the tightest volume in terms of like like pacing and story follow through. And I remember when I first got into Ruby, it was like when the last episode of Volume Six was airing, and I remember when I was watching it, I was like, man, it must have been so cool to watch this volume all the way through and just lose your mind. Like, oh, on some yes. episodes, yeah, it, oh, was it, was, it was. It absolutely was. Six was the uh, first one I watched live, so oh, I got yeah, same here. Full experience. I'm like so jealous of everybody who came in at six. Like you guys got it so easy. Oh, <laughs> all right. Uh, wish this is probably my favorite volume. Um, it's tossed up between three and this volume that are my favorite volumes for like obvious reasons. Um, yeah. <laughs> but also like, I feel like they did an amazing job on the fights this volume. So that's part mm -hmm. of the reason why I like it. Yeah, just such yeah. a jump from like some parts of five as well, I think in terms of the fights. Yeah, and oh, we'll, God, we'll get into that shortly. I would agree with pretty much everyone here. It's this is either my favorite or second favorite volume. I also really love Seven. Um, that would mm. be the only one that might be better than this. Um, but yeah, just like a real, it, it felt like a real correction. It felt like the show getting back on course after Five, which was really rocky in a lot of places, as we <laughs> discussed in great detail last episode. Um, 
So yeah, let's let's get into what worked here because there is quite a bit. Um, first of all, as Wish mentioned, the fights feel a lot better in this volume. There is a noticeable improvement right away. Um, Wish, do you just want to like go off on this since I feel like you're a bit more persnickety about the fights than the rest of us? So like one of my favorite fights this volume was definitely the Neo Cinder fight, but like I feel like you ha- did you have a slide for that somewhere? <laughs> no, it's not. It's this one. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, um, there was a lot of, like, momentum and stuff going on in that fight, and then, like, at the end of it, when it, like, when there's a reveal that it was actually just Neo's, like, illusion the whole time in the bar, and she was actually, like, keeping Cinder on her toes that whole time, uh, I was, like, pretty impressed by that, and I thought that it showed, like, a good example of how powerful, how, bleh, how powerful her semblance can be. I can speak English, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I never picked up on that before, that that's her illusion fighting in the bar. I thought she used to her shattery thing, because... Yeah, I didn't know that, that either. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah. I also did not realize that until right now. <laughs> she, like, because uh, it was her, um, her illusion shatter like that, so, like, she was just standing outside the bar, just letting her illusion do all the work for her, and she came around the corner like, hey, what up? But wait, so in Volume 2, when she's fighting, like, the very first time she fights in Volume 2 after the Mecha fight, when Yang goes and punches her, that's not Neil? That's her illusion? Yes. Oh. Fascinating. Mm. Now I have to, like, oh, God, now I feel I like I have to... Now I'm like, wait, we all need to, like, rewatch. <laughs> yeah, rewatch every Neo fight to see how many times she shatters in any given fight to see if she's getting stronger. Like a, a known thing that Neo's fights with her illusions that shatter? I feel like my world is being exploded by this moment. Yeah, uh, no, I, have I didn't know her illusions could, like... I didn't know she could do things, like, using those ashtrays and... I was under the impression... Yeah. Okay, this might this okay. is this is going to become an error or omission in the seven episode because <laughs> I was under the impression the way her illusions work is that if they get hit they shatter and so anytime you see an illusion shatter at some point between like she like creates the illusion mid fight and then it breaks. That's also what I thought. I thought, what I thought they were like Blake's shadow clones, basically. Yeah, that's that's exactly um, how I thought. Yeah. About it. I always think of it that's like uh better. yeah. I just never thought it through because I'm also like oh, I can turn into people. Yeah, I just kind of go with whatever they give us, and I'm like, that's Neo. I'm sure somebody in the comments will correct us on this, but well, I also wish I'm, not, I'm also actually not even sure they've given us enough, honestly, like yeah. enough information about ourselves for any, for any of us to actually have a definitive like answer. To be honest, like because we've seen her obviously more than other people, but it's like she obviously fought in the tournament in volume three, and that. I'm assuming she got hit at some point, and you know, I mean, I don't know, but whatever. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. They you have really yourself. Stuff. But when okay. she kicks the ashtrays, it is hella cool. Yes. Oh, that's some that's sick cool. choreography. I love that fight. I would go yeah. back and rewatch it. That fight's amazing. <laughs> that's music. Music. Yeah, Max, that's your favorite Drama. song, isn't it? One thing is like your favorite. Yeah. Album. There are yeah, there are very few Ruby songs that I really like, and one thing is one of them. Yeah, it's a great one. <laughs> It's like 40% of Neo's characterization in that <laughs> And you know what? I am perfectly happy with that because uh, it, it says, it doesn't say anything like too revolutionary. It's just like, yeah, she was like abandoned and Roman took her in and now she wants to fucking kill Ruby. Um, and that's pretty, <laughs> we, we could sort of surmise that just by watching yeah. the show. Um, oh, speaking of Neo abandoned and taken in, though, that is one of my favorite, like, out there volume six series is that she was abandoned after the farms. Like, she was at the... Oh, she was um, one of the... Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah she was I one of the... That. Wait, yeah. I don't know this theory. What is this? That oh. in the Apathy Farm, I can't remember the name of the actual farm, oh, but in the okay. Apathy Farm, oh, that picture room. on the wall, uh-huh. there's, like, a little girl and a boy who's kind of a redhead, and it looks like it could be Neo and Roman, and, like, that's their origin story. <laughs> oh, that would be interesting. That would be interesting, right? That would be I'm, like, wild. Such a reach, but I'm into it's so, it. It's such a reach, but yeah, go yeah. for it. Like, fun. <laughs> I've connected the dots. You haven't connected shit. I've connected them. <laughs> I, need, I need something. We gotta give Neo a character somehow, and there's... There's something there. She she oh, crumbs so... where we can get him. She yeah. <laughs> she doesn't need a character, man. Her redemption oh. arc is coming. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> oh yeah. She doesn't need a character. She like fights with an umbrella and she's cute. Like what more do you need? Yeah, she looks so cool. That's all I need. Um I also and she's very small. Yes. <laughs> small. Um mm-hmm. 
I also love the the end of this fight where after like Cinder sort of like talks her down or like they they like negotiate the end of it. Cinder's like, all right, let's talk. And then there's just like a pause, and then Neo <laughs> points at her mouth, and Cinder's like, ah, right. <laughs> I like oh that, my god. I like that Cinder is kind of like uh, fighting off Neo, and like Neo is holding her own, but then Cinder just gets like set up with the whole fight, and it's like, okay, it's well made in time. Yes. Like, yeah. Oh, man. Um, lots of other good fights in this volume as well. First of all, like we get off to like a pretty strong start with the fight on the Argus Limited. Oh, that's such a that great home too. for the volume. Such, such a good home. Yes. <laughs> I was so excited about the Neo and Cinder fight that I completely skipped over that. But yes, that is a good fight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just so it, good. It's, it's such a such strong great fight. Was really. Yeah. I remember, I have like a very distinct memory of this because I was so hyped for six that I actually, um, do you guys remember when like they did the Fathom Events premieres? Yes, I went to them. Yeah, I yeah. went, I went to the, um, the, Fa- the Fathom Events volume six premiere at the, uh, what was it? It was like the Chinatown AMC in Washington, D.C. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> um, so if you- What, what are these, the Fathom Events? So if you, I have no idea. Oh. You, they were they like premiere the, vo- the, the, the um, like a theater. Yeah, we were like the, the first episode in like theaters. Like a couple days early. Yeah. Oh, cute. Yeah, mm-hmm. they stopped, they didn't do one for seven, but uh, I think they <laughs> so did- that be one for eight. budget thing. Well, yeah, it probably cost a bunch of money that they didn't make back. Though that theater was not full, let me tell you. Um, oh my god, mine were all yeah. mine were packed every hard. time. Oh mine my, were so packed. Seriously, oh man, it wasn't packed yeah. in Midland, Texas. I was surprised we got it at all. <laughs> yeah, gu- guess there's there was one in Midland. <laughs> There was, and I went to it, and it was full of Black Sun shippers. <laughs> Aww. Lol. Mine was full of, like, bumblebee shippers. It was very fun. Aww. That must have been so nice. It was very fun. I guess what... I mean, it was so, yeah. I, th- I think I, what we I hadn't heard of Ruby yet. <laughs> what we've learned from this is that LA is full of fucking weeaboos, which, you know, tell me, oh, some- sure. <laughs> tell me something I don't know. Yeah, honestly. Oh, man. You... Anyone who spends enough time in Lil Tokyo knows that that city is full of weeaboos. <laughs> like my sister. <laughs> yeah, like Sunny. Anyway, Argus. Argus yes, Sunday. yes. Right. Okay, yeah. Basically, I was I saw this at in a theater after like an hour of them just showing the uh, the like last few episodes of Five and me being like I cannot believe I paid however much I paid for this. But it I immediately felt like as soon as the fight started like oh like we're back, baby. Like they've they're they've got the juice back, you know. Um, there's it's just like compared to especially like um, the Beacon Acad the Beacon Academy, the Haven Academy fight, and sort of a lot of the fights in Five. It felt like a lot more sort of kinetic and exciting. There was some like really neat choreography, like particularly when they take down the giant manticore at the end with like Blake and Yang like wrapping the gamble shroud around it to tie it down and then Weiss breaking its wings and then Ruby and Crow jumping in like doing <laughs> the like ridiculously dangerous like double like I don't even know what you would call that they just like spin around in the air and like dissect or bisect it we um, need to talk about Yang grabbing the manticore by its horns and oh, just oh, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. we have to talk about Yang <laughs> yeah. Oh, we will talk about Yang. I think as a fight, you can parallel this so well to uh, Ruby versus Nevermore in terms of like yes. vibes. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, and even with like the character beats, like you have Bumblebee like actually doing Bumblebee and Yang throwing the Manticore, kind of could parallel like when she's punching the grim in the face and yelling, "I hope you're hungry!" And like like the vibes feel really similar to me. And it's like them all coming together as a team, right? So it was awesome. Yeah. I think that really is a lot of it, is that it feels like we're getting back to where we were before. Um, yeah, gang's all here, you know? Both in terms of, like, the actual production and just, like, the tone. Yes. Yeah. I'm Plus you get a great they... flirting moment. There's a I, really that's good... coming, that's coming. I put a whole note in about the flirting. <laughs> <laughs> it's no, but also, no. like, I'm always worried, like, when they when Ruby and Crow go in for that, like, sight move thing. That, yeah. I'm always like Blake's Blake's ribbon, like they're gonna cut it, and sometimes they don't. <laughs> Every single time, I'm like, how did they avoid that? 
gonna say. They were they're, careful. They're just okay. that good. They're just so good. They're really yeah. threading that needle. Like, nobody's yeah. business. I mean, yeah, Ruby okay. Ruby fights do not always obey the laws of physics. In fact, they never that's do. That's why we love them. Yeah. <laughs> that's what makes it fun. Oh, actually, before we move on, I just want to say, I know no one else here gives a shit about White Rose, but... As like a <laughs> as like a part time white rose shipper, I do appreciate some of the some of the fun little uh, moments we get during both this fight and on the train. Uh, like mainly the fact that uh, Weiss has a red scarf um, in this volume, which I just appreciate. Well, red is one of Weiss's uh, character colors. It's like she has more yes. of it now. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> They, she that. she grabs yeah. her and they she spit. She wears Louboutin. Independence <laughs> <laughs> color. Dude, yeah. Weiss absolutely wears Louboutins. I feel like if yeah, if you do nice. if you do like a modern AU for Ruby, Weiss needs to be wearing red bottoms. Yeah, oh, man, I read this fic where she's wearing Louboutins once. And it was really oh. good. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Set up. Moving on. <laughs> Whatever horrible thing Mark is gonna say. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I just wanna sneak in and add that, like, I think in one of the episodes prior, I said that it felt like the weapons didn't really have any weight. It kind of seemed like it got, it, like, they got the hang of it in this volume with the new animation setup. Mm. So, like, mm. it did look like there was like a good amount of momentum happening, and they were using their weapons to propel themselves and stuff like that, like they used to. So, I liked that too. Do you know For if sure, or when the guy breaks his arm, that has weight to it too. Oh, that's one of those moments where you have to like look away from the screen. They don't even show it, but you just like flinch instinctively. You hear it. Absolutely. You hear it. Exactly. <laughs> just the crunch. Gross. Um, Wish, do you know if there was like um because you said the new animation setup, do you know if there was like a production shift between five and six? Like was there some like technical thing going on there? Um, I know that they well, it wasn't so much like a technical thing. I know they were getting used to the new animation program and they had to hire more people to get in on it. So they did hire like new animators and stuff like that. Gotcha. Yeah. And we'll get into some of that in the discourse slide, which is, you know. Um, all right. Another great fight this volume. Uh, and we'll talk about the, the sort of story beats behind this. But uh, Blake and Yang versus Adam. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. It's the best thing I've ever seen. Yeah, Iconic. like, even without all of the shipping stuff, which has its own slide that's going to take us, like, two hours to get through, <laughs> it's just, like, a fun fight to watch. There's just a oh, lot really? of great yeah, stuff going on there. Fight, absolutely. It's, like, one of the best ones the show has ever done, I think. You're like, right. I'm yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, both get a turn, and then they go in together. It's, no, it is. It's really fun to see them, like... <laughs> It's like multiple fights in one is the thing. Like like three different fights basically yeah. that that somehow it's like so cohesive that it's just like so it's like so much fun to watch. Yang does a lot of like footwork like that you haven't seen her yes. doing in a really long time too. Yeah. And I love no, that. No, and like the way okay, this is uh, this is yeah, this is actually I was trying to think if I was gonna get into shipping territory if this was really like, fight stuff, but no, this is really fight stuff. No, I actually just really also like love to see the way like Yen's fighting style has evolved because like mm-hmm. she the way that she like waits for Adam to attack her to like really understand how he moves and what he does before she strikes back is so interesting and like she doesn't that's something she obviously did not do before or did not used to do um and I think they do like a just it's like a really great example in this fight of how smart she's gotten and even even like with her saying it absolutely it's just like I like that we get to see that evolution happen like it was just so satisfying yeah, I think Yang as a fighter has such a strong thread, like, through all the volumes that really comes together in this fight. Like, I love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yang's fighting style almost has better character development than she does at times. Controversial statement, Max. Controversial. Yeah, disagree. <laughs> Agree to disagree. <laughs> I'm just saying she was really thin in the first three, okay? Agree to disagree. Well, that's true. Volume well, two, she has good character development. Oh, no, that is true. Two. No, I agree with yeah. you. Yeah, I was flip-flopping there for a second, but no, Mercedes, you're right. It's okay. I got you. Yeah. All right. Uh, Yeah, that fight also has, like, two of my favorite moments in the whole show. Uh, A, Adam getting hit with the bike, of course. Oh, my God, yeah! Yeah. Yes! I will never get tired of people just editing random songs to, like, Adam uh, getting hit with the bike. Um, I did one the other day to uh, uh, Hooked on a Feeling. He get, like, hit twice, so it, like, lines up with the hooked on a feeling. That's always fun. Oh, my God. I just love shit like that. Um, incre- no, that was just incredible. Like, the fact, like, we made so many jokes about him getting a hit with her bike. And they were like, what if we put this in the show? And I was like, this is the most galaxy brain thing anybody has ever done. 
Like, they really to, care. It shows that they care. They <laughs> literally, like, that, like, if we, it was just a joke. Like, this thing, like, it was, like, the biggest joke we could have had. It's like, oh, Yang's gonna hit him with her bike. Yo, she people were, like, up. literally making that joke. Yes, and she straight up just fucking drives she, her bike into his face, basically. And, like, I can, I literally still to this day cannot believe we witnessed that moment happen with that sound. <laughs> that just, like, oh, you know, that crash. It was incredible. It was great. That whole episode, you must have felt like you were blacking out. I literally was blacking out. I was like, there's no, I literally don't even think I remember watching this the first time because I was just like blacked out with like what happened. <laughs> I watched it like 10 times that day at least. Other favorite moment from this fight is when um, <laughs> Yang grabs Adam's sword. Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh, actual chills. <laughs> like literally, I like yeah. I cried. I like teared up watching it the other night. Goosebumps right now. One of the most satisfying moments I have ever seen in that show. Oh my God. The fact that like, again, I mentioned this in another episode that after volume four, you don't see her use her semblance in any of her mm -hmm. fights up until that point. And like, because that was like a whole thing that she uses it too much. And she's like, just like jumping in head first, not thinking about the consequences. And then she like waits the whole fight to pull it out at exactly yes. that moment. Right moment. Mm. Oh man, like they really build up to it. And so the payoff is enormous. Of no semblance. And then... yeah. Well, and five, you can see her like waiting, like struggling to wait for her right time too, right? So it's yeah. like culmination of it all. She just knows. Oh my god! When the, the the dust clears and she's like on fire, which I know that they had. Remember the anime is like we want. They wanted to bring it back for so long. She couldn't figure out how to do it. Oh really? And she's on like, fire Maya? and then she, the yeah. red eyes and oh my god! And I'm she's like, like, but I'm smarter. And she just flings it away. Oh, oh it's like oh. literally never been a more satisfying moment in television. Absolutely. I also really appreciate that they didn't leave any room for us to think Adam might come back. <laughs> yes. Yeah, like that. he they were double like, stabbed and then dashed on some rocks. Yeah, they literally were like, he just some people were trying and though, to hold on to the hope. They snapped his spine. On there, yeah, there was some cope. And then they were like, he's dead. And they yeah. were like, thank you. <laughs> yeah, they they were not, they did not hesitate to get rid of him. Um, yeah, I, th um, was I going to say anything else? I think we've covered just about everything like for that. Like Spider-Manning up the cliff and then punching Adam in the face. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Thank and you. Six-inch heels. Oh, I know. <laughs> God. He's legend. Let's just all me. <laughs> when Yang is like, catch your breath for a second, and then she like jumps into the fight. That was a good one. Oh, the semblance. Wait, we should talk about the semblance. Uh, is that a story beat? Kind of. Yeah. Oh, I, I remember. Actually, wait. I remember the other thing I wanted to bring up. This is actually like, this is like a quote unquote controversy, but I don't really treat it like one. An interesting fun fact about this fight is that a lot of the animation, specifically in the part where uh, Yang is fighting Adam on her own, that was actually Monty animation because yeah. so yeah. so yes in in volume three that scene where Yang gets her arm cut off, originally it was supposed to be an entire fight. She wasn't supposed to just jump in and get one-shotted, um, but they cut it for reasons? I'm not- Emotional reasons? Yeah. Wait, is that why the footwork is so good? Yes. That's a bummer. <laughs> yeah, it's disappointing to learn that the new animators didn't do that, but I mean, there's, an, there's enough other good stuff in that fight that I don't feel, I you know- I think it made more sense to push it back to, to... Oh yeah, because Me too. that her improvement oh. like shows a lot more, and it we probably wouldn't have got had the same effect. <laughs> no, I agree. I think like the growth was like way more satisfying than if they had just like done this oh, at yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. She needed to lose like badly in volume three the way she did for her growth to be complete. I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. They had to bring her to a very very low place before she could come back. Yeah. Um, like, I think it would have been a different arc for her if she had fought him and almost won and then lost at the last minute. I think it, Yeah, that would have been a yeah. Win. Yeah, it would have been a very different story. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I would have liked it as much. Exactly. No, I don't think so either. It wouldn't have, like, taught her what she needed to learn, you know? Yeah. Not yeah. that she should have gotten her arm cut off to learn something, but if she <laughs> had to. <laughs> it's storytelling, you know? It's storytelling. <laughs> um, also, another fun fight moment in this volume is... Um, the fight with the giant robot, but specifically the climax of that fight where Ruby oh jumps into the cannon. 
Yeah, I have a very strong reaction to that. Yeah, Merc, just go off. <laughs> <laughs> the one point where she jumps in the cannon and uh, Jean is like, um, the missile launcher springs out, but the raw dust, dust locks in. And then she just her little ha and shoots is like maybe my favorite moment of the entire series. I'm obsessed oh. with it. It's like <laughs> so <laughs> epic and I bring it up a lot. <laughs> That's definitely another one of those, like, chef's kiss moments where it's yes. just, like, extremely satisfying. Um, I'm, like, mostly... There's, like, some pretty good stuff in that fight. I'm, like, not as crazy about it. Um, but there, that was one of the highlights for sure. What's really good in that fight is the uh, score. <laughs> it's really good lead motifs and stuff. Speaking of the giant robot fight, I guess, uh, one, of my other, one of my other favorite things about this volume is that we meet Maria. Yeah, uh, oh, nice. Maria, you <laughs> love her. She brings chaotic old lady energy to the show, which is a very fun addition. Um, I have seen some disagreement as to, like, I think some people find her a lot funnier than others, and that's sort of... She makes me laugh, that's funny. Yeah. 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 It makes me laugh. Hilarious. I, I love her lore. Her lore is amazing, though. Definitely. Oh, her lore is so good. Oh, my God. Yeah. That flashback is fantastic. Yeah, it's a good one. It's very good. I... The, the fact that Tok is a single-use villain for that flashback is a travesty, because that design slaps so goddamn hard. I agree. Tok's design does slap, but I kind of like that Tok is this really distinctive, interesting villain we only see for 10 minutes, because it gives you the idea of the kind of, like, players Salem has been bringing forth, like, yes. years. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I get it. I understand. But also, I'm just, like... Show, show me more, more of the crocodile lady. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to see more. Metal teeth? Is it metal teeth? Metal teeth. Oh yeah, that was just deeply disturbing, honestly. Yeah, it was upsetting. God. That was... <sighs> disturbing, but also fucking sick. So, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, Maria has a lot of great lines. I love all her shtick with Weiss on the plane. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gives, gives Weiss another excuse to just be, like, snarky and over it again, which is, like, a fun side of her to see. Over it is, like, really the, one of the best, those are the best moments of Weiss, and she's just like, I've had enough of this yeah. nonsense. Weiss and Maria deserve an arc where they have to go on a road trip together. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yes! <laughs> That is the exact energy that that plane ride has, is them being on, is like being on a road trip with like your mom who you don't like. You're, you're on like pretty good terms, but you're at like very different head spaces for this trip. Mm -hmm. It's just like your crazy aunt or something who you don't yeah. see all that often mm -hmm. except for family reunions. Crazy aunt energy. <laughs> it's just your deeply eccentric aunt with like your birds deeply or something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The, the ant who has, like, an unusual number of pets. <laughs> like, all one animal. Or, like, collects, like, taxidermy heads or something. Oh, God. Ooh. Maria would collect, like, weird stuff. She would collect animals. weird shit. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can definitely see that. Um, uh, Hoarder Maria headcanon. Also, I'm a big fan of the scene where she's, like, talking to Ruby about the silver eyes. Um, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. that's a bit of exposition that I feel like, it feels like a little bit more natural in the sense that, like, we, the audience, are also very eager to learn about this, and that we've mm -hmm. been getting just, like, bits and pieces up until now. And even then, they don't just, like, explain it out in, like, full detail, full, yeah, full detail, because Maria's like, yeah, there's, like, a lot of stuff about this that even I don't know, um, because mm -hmm. it's all very- The music really sweeps you along. Oh, it, the music right? is all sticking that Yeah, scene. that Red, like, Roses remix. Oh, yeah, that was great. Oh, yes. I really like that shot of the butterfly opening, too. That was good. Yeah, it's another one of those, like, the rare quiet moments that I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um... Okay. Actually, sorry, oh wait, okay. yeah, let's go back. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say though, like actually, that exposition is interesting to me compared to their earlier expositions, specifically when Crow is doing that huge info dump, um, because they've learned more about like what ways to frame the shot to like keep you along along the ride with exposition yes. instead of it just being one shot of everyone on a campfire, like something like that framing of the butterfly opening and stuff, like really keeps your visual interest. So shows their, their growth as storytellers. I like that. I, I was gonna makers. bring this up during the discourse slide for um, the, the gin info dump, but I might as well say it now. I think one key thing they've learned is the principle 
I there's a couple names for it. I think um, Save the Cat calls it like the Pope in the pool. Uh, I I personally call it the Margot Robbie approach because there's a scene in the movie The Big Short where they're like, we got to explain all these complex financial terms to you, but it's really boring. So here's Margot Robbie in a bathtub drinking champagne to explain it to you instead, which is basically <laughs> if you can do exposition and you can have like big chunks of, of information so long as you make it visually interesting. Um, right. And so just like getting a little better at like the, the, the cinematography, the cinematography of it all um, and like giving us some more interesting shots to look at. Um, go, really does go a long way to make the info dumps feel less uh, shoehorned, I guess. Mm -hmm. And also, this just felt like more, I think you said natural, but also just like more conversational in a way. Like, this is, mm. this didn't feel like it was for the audience. Like, a lot of the other info dumps do sometimes feel like they're for the audience. Like, they're like, we need to get all this information out to you watching. So we're going to have Crow say a billion things right now. So like, will the remnants been canceled? We need to yeah, the remnants yep. canceled. Yep. <laughs> exactly. But this was literally like, no, Ruby needed to know this information and has needed to know it for a long time and nobody has told her and here's the only character who actually can give her any information on it whatsoever. So it just felt like, like it, it felt like we were just watching that moment happen, not like they were like, this moment is specifically for you. It also, and they led up to it, right? Like, she's yeah. been asking Maria about it for a couple episodes now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It yeah. also leads directly into the big kaiju battle at the end, because that's the information she needs in order to exactly. stop that thing. So. so it was, like, a good through line. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Again, the, the, the writers on the show, I give them a lot of shit, but they really are improving. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Uh, the volume six pacing is so good. Speaking <laughs> of the writers doing good things this volume. Let's talk about the apathy. Oh! The apathy- I was, like, I was just struck by the apathy as a lot of people. Like, I thought it was okay, but everyone goes on like it was like the spookiest thing ever. So the it thing is, it's terrifying. Yeah. Look at those yeah. fucking things. Look at the way they move. I hate things that move the way they're not supposed to move. It's like That's the whole, true. Like, it's the whole like, apathy arc is just like a big horror story. And I love it that. Is. I agree. And even the music is just, the Maybe. noise they make. Oh, Ooh, mm -hmm. yeah. The, the noise screech. Is really good. The sound design was incredible on the, on, for this. Um, the comparison I always make. This is the first time oh, I've felt like a threat, too. So, like. Yes, that's definitely a big element of this is that I think we we talked about this a bit before with like some of the other like larger Grimm encounters is just creating like unique Grimm that present different challenges and force uh, Team Ruby to fight them in new ways and like actually feel like a real threat as opposed to just disposable cannon fodder. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is a, a nice change of pace from like the early volumes especially. Um, and this is like the best example of that. I always say that this episode reminds me of this. I hope this makes sense. The good Stephen Moffat episodes of Doctor Who. So like Weeping Angels. Yes. Or like mm. or like some of the better episodes with the silence, stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, yes. Where it's just this like really cool sort of self-contained story with like a, a unique, like really creepy monster where there's kind of a gimmick around it. Um, and, like, that's a premise that, like, there's a lot of stuff you can do with that, and it makes for some very, it can make for some very compelling television. Yes. Agreed. And I also mm -hmm. like that this, like, the thing that was interesting about them is they weren't, which I think is why they also felt threatening, it's like they weren't something they could physically fight. Right. Like, their their whole design was intended so that, like, they would just zap the will to live, basically, the will to fight back. So, I think that was just, like, that was such an important, I think, trait that they were given that made them feel so powerful because like ruby literally could do nothing like routine ruby not ruby the character oh god sorry it's just it, it's just very good and they're also like a lot more relatable for the audience who like can relate with like depression and like oh yeah and stuff. And i think and that's, that's what, what they're, they're based, based on. on yeah yeah that's the, yeah <laughs> so it makes it a lot scarier for the audience because it feels more real to like us instead of just like the monsters and... it just gives it like another layer it's like a more complex yeah. sort of it's like, um, it's a good sure. horror movie monster in that it taps yeah. into something that you're already afraid of and just gives it sort of like um, physical form. Scary mm -hmm. face. <laughs> exactly. Scary noises. Yep, yep, yep. As Grimm, they still didn't do it for me, but I do like the place they have narratively in the volume. Like, 
I think that Ruby did need that moment to breathe and be sad and have a couple conversations, and the app the, gave a good framework for that. So I like that. So Mark, wait, what? So what? What grim do do it for you? I don't know. I don't really care about the grim. Mark, like I'm not a monster fucker. You <laughs> <laughs> must have been mistaken with someone uh-huh. else. <laughs> so- have her mistaken with my entire Patreon Discord server. <laughs> Don't have time yeah. to get into that. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. I mean, you touched on this a little bit, but like the main thing that I think, or another part that makes the apathy so good is the thematic relevance in that they are a sort of direct response to like how Ruby is, how Team Ruby is feeling after the Jin mm-hmm. info dump, where it's like, yeah, your fight is now hopeless. And so the fact that they immediately go and do a fight with a monster whose whole thing is they drain your will to fight. Um, it's just like, it's, it's, it's very, it's a nice little like narrative package, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I also I, really like to have it affects them all differently. Like you can tell that it's affecting obviously Ruby the least after like, and not, I mean, she's still affected, but she kind of retains a little bit more of that strength. than I think everybody else like Yang and Blake who are obviously at odds with each other and Weiss who desperately does not want to go back to Atlas because she literally just escaped it. And, and it's like they have, and yeah, Crow, who is like a fucking wreck at this point. Like, oh, yeah. they just all have their these different narrative reasons for why they are like st- all just sort of like not willing to give up, but they are able to reach that point with less pushing from the apathy. Even like Ruby, who was like, wait, what the hell are we doing? Like, let's get this shit together. I guess I have the question um, with the apathy is, is it? kind of more frustrating that we don't know if their hopelessness is real or if we can blame it on the apathy or is it interesting that we'll never really know what do you mean well like i was thinking one thing that kind of bumps for me the apathy is that i kind of did want to see ruby at bottom where they're like should we give up what's going on but we'll never know if they had those feelings like genuinely like if they ever could be pushed to that hopelessness or if it was the effect Mm. of the apathy and is it more interesting as a mystery or would it have been better otherwise sorry wish what were you saying oh no it's fine i i would like to think that they were all kind of feeling that way and the apathy just kind of amplified those feelings yeah yeah oh definitely exacerbated it but can i think they were susceptible but do you think team ruby can hit that point of hopelessness like without intervention i guess they don't i think I think is it like an who they are? I think it's different actually from character to character at this point. Mm-hmm. Like, because I kind of feel like they have already, they've separately hit different low points. Like, I think Ruby is kind of the only one who has not actually hit that, hit that point of like hopelessness. Like, I think Yang has hit it. Yeah. And I think they've hit it from different things. But I think the fact that they have been there already means we probably would not, I would say at this point in the show, see them hit that again. I think Weiss hit it in volume yeah. four too. Yeah, Weiss yes. hit it in four. Yeah. Blake hit it, it in four. Again. Yeah, Blake and Yang hit it. Everyone hit it in four. <laughs> yeah, everybody so Ruby. 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 We need Ruby Ruby needs to go ape shit. Oh, it's coming. Yeah, Ruby's gonna fall apart next volume. <laughs> oh, totally. Let's fucking go. Also, one last note on the apathy before we move on is I, I love the metaphorical resonance of Weiss uh burning down the mansion with bottles of liquor. I think that's just yeah, like a nice having touch. the least patience for booze is always funny. On the yes, mm-hmm. I like it's that. Just like it's a nice drama. touch. Yeah, she's so dramatic. She's a dramatic <laughs> legend. Like I love her. She's just like I'm gonna throw these bottles and set this shit on fire. Like yes, Weiss, do it. <laughs> she and Blake bonded about that later. They're like, isn't burning down mansions fun? Yeah. I need. I need. They were like arson. <laughs> <laughs> I need one more person to commit arson, and then I'll make my Ruby AMV to uh, Talking Heads burning down the house. <laughs> we need Yang to like light some shit on fire, like in her yeah. cells or whatever. That's what we need. Yang must be furious that Blake and Weiss have both torch houses, and she never has. I know. She's like, when is it matter of time, time though? Yeah. She'll do it. Watch Ruby burn down a house before Yang does. <laughs> Yang's like, oh, come on, my yeah. is on fire. <laughs> exactly. <sighs> All right. Everyone, deep breath. Oh, no. Okay. Deep, okay. Here we go. Okay, deep, okay, okay, okay. Do you know what time it is? I can guess. It's real Bumblebee hours. Yeah! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. If everyone's wondering why this is all of our favorite volumes, um, well, th- this is most of the reason why. <laughs> if, we're, if we're being honest here. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And 
I mean, I love it overall, but yes. Yeah. It's not our fault there's such a strong narrative thread through the volume. Right? Exactly. Like, it's, not, it's not our fault that they are soulmates. Like, I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah like, How do we like, resist that? Their I mean, eyes are the colors of each other's good. auras. They are. <laughs> that is they beautiful. Sure are. Yeah. Oh, they are. Um, and where's the little purple bandana I'm around me? right now. The... Okay, for those of you who aren't like hardcore Bumblebee shippers and and or <laughs> did not experience this in real time, when I was on Tumblr, when the last few episodes of Volume 6 were premiering, the best way I can describe it is that it, have you ever seen like a 20,000 person Twitch chat post like rows of like Pog Champ, just like a solid wall of that yes. for like five <laughs> minutes straight? Yes. It was like that, but over a couple weeks. You're right. That's, like the <laughs> That's exactly what it was like. That is exactly. Every Bumblebee stan was just aggressively pogging IRL <laughs> for days after this happened. And they deserved uh, it. Like months. They it was like, that till, like the end of March or something, practically. Yeah. Okay. We were, we were hitting those like number one ship on like Tumblr every fucking week. It hit yeah, the yeah, fan yeah. metrics. It was, it was like, crazy. Summer it was on there. <laughs> oh man that was the catradora of that winter <laughs> okay so to give this some semblance of like structure i'm just gonna have us go through this sort of like point by point and just like talk about the highlights screams on all your points <laughs> yeah because i thought it'd be funny but i have a sep i have a notepad next to me so i can remember what to talk about because i wanted oh, to maintain this okay. joke um so point one ah ah okay um first of all the little scene on the train they have with the bag uh, oh that's the way Blake's one. ears just like pop up when she hears yang's voice though yes this volume is really blake paying extreme like extremely close attention to yang constantly well, she wants to win her back <laughs> no but it's like she's like spacing out looking out the window and then yang's like yeah and she's like oh shit yeah. yeah, he's speaking. The little, the little vote with the bag was like Blake trying so hard and then still being a tiny bit out of sync with each other too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She just like doesn't know how to fix. It's like, it's interesting because like you clearly know that it needs to be talked about yeah. and that they have not talked about it yet and that Blake is very aware of that fact but doesn't know how to approach it. Yeah, so she just tries to do little things for her, but it's, yeah. like, kind of awkward. Like, that's so real. Like, I feel that. It's uh -huh. so, oh, it was so good. Yeah, like, she's just yeah. trying to, like, make it up to her almost in these, in these like, really tiny, insignificant ways that, that Yang doesn't need. Because there's, she like, probably no made other her, outlet. She probably made her, like, 75 cups of tea a day. Like, <laughs> over the course of volume six. Right, Are we going to watch the ears go up and down all day? I know, like, your talk? animation? Excellent. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Are we going to talk about the literal sunshine or? Oh, yes. That appears right behind <laughs> us. Um, yeah, I think I missed this. Oh, uh, there's a scene where, um, like, Blake is literally looking at Yang and behind them, it, like, lights up. Like, yes, yeah, like the sun comes like, out. Like a bright filter on the background of that. Oh, the romance. <laughs> it's, like, right before yeah. Weiss and Ruby, like, lean into frame to smile at her. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's like very cute. Ship it. She's just longingly staring at her. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, one of the highlights of, I mean, a lot of the reason why I like these two so much is that it's one of the rare plot lines where there is actually a lot of subtlety that goes into it when yes. so much of the show is like basically like important points with big flashing signs around them. Um, and there is there is like some of that with these two, but it's a lot more, like, natural. There's not as no. much just, like, sitting down and just, like, pouring your feelings out on the table and just, like, explaining everything in detail. Yeah, Bumblebee's, so like, a true slow burn, and you're really starting to see that, like, come to the forefront now. But also, like, this volume, because, like, subtlety is, like, really the name of this volume, like, just for them, because, like, I have to give so much credit to the animators and also the writers, because, like, literally, Blake and Yang have so many tiny background moments that are like would be like nobody would notice if they were not us who were obsessively looking for this thing <laughs> yes <laughs> just like like there are moments like when you know yang goes to speak and like when they're outside the train after it's crashed and like blake says what she's going to say just before she says it and like yang looks at her or there's moments where like yang is speaking and blake stares at her and continues staring at her after it's over or they like exchange a glance like they these things happen so frequently throughout this volume and they're so purposeful and deliberate like even when I'm just going to list this. I know we'll talk about this later and scream about it. But also, like, when um, Yang takes Blake's hand when they're leaving the farmhouse. Like, 
And like Blake says, like a home, because it's clearly scripted. It's like these really tiny things that clearly they knew we would be paying attention to and that we're, they wanted to put there. Um, Especially because it's, it's animation, it's intentional. Yeah. They didn't just catch a cool shot of someone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they literally had to sit there and be like, how can we make this relationship and this build up clear to the people who know it's there? And like to people now who maybe aren't looking for it, they can go back and see like it has been building and like there has been this thread this whole time. That's the mise en scene, baby. Hell yes. Um, yeah. I okay. I have an extremely spicy take. I'm gonna. Yikes. I'm actually gonna retract my previous statement about Yang's fighting style having more having more character development than she does because that's really just volume one. Um, but that's fair. Uh, okay. Yeah, just volume one. Uh, but my actual extremely spicy take is I think Ruby <laughs> is just a better show. For people who get really into Bumblebee early on, because if you're constantly looking for like small moments that could hint at their relationship, you'll find so much shit, and there's like so much more to unpack and like dig into than if you're not looking for any of that stuff. And like all of this subtlety we're talking about just completely goes over your head because it's just like not within your field of vision, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. if you watch volume one being like, White Rose is endgame, it's harder to look. <laughs> yeah, but I, don't, I actually don't even think that's a spicy take. I just think that's like, you know, like, this is an element of the show that has been present this whole time. And if if it's not something you're interested in, then that is an entire element of the show that you are missing. And I think that can be applied to those, like any show. Like, if there is a, a relationship or a, a plot you don't enjoy, like, that's just an element you're going to miss, like, no matter what, because it's not your thing. But, like... I do think that for us, and I mean, this is obviously extremely layered as to all the reasons that this is a, appealing and a better show for from this perspective for us and all that stuff. <laughs> but um, like, I do think, yeah, there's a lot more to sort of look for and look forward to from our perspective, especially especially when you've been watching it this long. And I, this is probably the discourse I'm assuming, but when you've been watching it for so long and so many people told you you were wrong and you were right. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah there's a whole other slide for that don't worry slide, about it but it's just like yes this is definitely i don't even think that's spicy i think that is just true because there is something in here that is specifically i think for us that is like you know we're getting a lot out of that i think other people aren't like so yeah but that is a, that is a good point in that like any show or like long-running series with that has a big emphasis on like that or like that devotes a lot of time to like uh, like a romantic plot line if you don't like those two together then yeah you're just gonna like the show less that's just yeah. sort of that's mm. that's just how the cookie crumbles I suppose that's how it crumbles mm -hmm. I do always think like I'm always like oh man I wish I'd watch this show live all the way but sometimes they're like mm, I think it would have been frustrating sometimes it was <laughs> I actually I think most frustrating thing was just the fandom like I don't actually think it was the show itself I think it was really like the fandom was frustrating. I mean, we'll get into this. <laughs> we will. We got to keep moving. We got a lot of stuff to cover. We have more Bumblebee to discuss. Um, Blake, and Yang, Bumblebee to Blake and Yang in the storehouse at like the Apathy <laughs> episode where they have their little conversation there. Very good. Again, you can tell that Blake is just like, I mean, obviously does not want to, you know, be away from Yang period at all. And it's like, thanks, you close touch But like, just as she volunteers them, it's like, I just like another example of like, she just knows that there's like this rift that she's trying to close, but does not know how. Yeah. So like the little fight they have in the story room, I really like too, because it shows that Blake's like, she's almost there. She almost knows what Yang is looking for yes. right now, but she's not yeah. quite there. Like she's still trying to figure it she's out. So close. Yeah. Yeah. She almost gets it. And then she just does it. And I also felt like that was really relatable. It was just, just such a real just moment. Miss. Shoot and miss. Yeah. yeah. And like Yang maybe even would have gotten herself into a headspace where she could have like, uh, telegraphed it to Blake, but then she saw Adam outside the window too, right? So part of her mm -hmm. distress in that scene is because she's all freaking out because of that, right? So. Yeah, and so the apathy are also already having yeah. their impact, which I actually, like, thinking about that, I really, really hate shows when they just sort of employ miscommunication as a tactic. Nah. You know, like that, that could be easily avoided. And yeah. I think this is actually a really good example of a moment that I I don't think that they could have resolved because of all of the circumstances happening. Like Yang just experiencing PTSD and then also the apathy were already draining them. Like she literally says she's how tired she is. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. well, they, they already don't have the energy to get into this. And it's like, I just think that this was a 
this could actually not have been avoided, which I enjoy. I think it makes it more, it gives it more weight. Well, I think often miscommunication is used in stories for, like, unnecessarily dragging things out. Yes, and in this situation, exactly. it's used as, like, a, a step between them growing towards where they need to be, right? So totally. it feels I, more valuable. I'm 100% with you about, like, people not communicating properly being used to drag out stories. I have, like, dude, I could do a whole, like, two-hour podcast of just me complaining about the manga Citrus because like oh, oh my god 90% yeah, warned against that. 90% of the plot in that manga is just like <laughs> one character doesn't want to talk about her feelings and it's freaking out another character and they can't just if they just fucking talk to each other we wouldn't have any problems but that's a whole other thing um of course, but like, it, it, it's the worst for little characters who are just like if they would just talk to each other it would be fine in this yeah. case it's like they're trying and it is it's actually highlighting how not fine it is. Yeah. Here there's like some real, like, there's some thought that went into this in the sense that, like you said, yeah. Blake knows that there's something off, but she doesn't know exactly what it is um, and doesn't quite know how to broach the subject. Yeah. Um, but given that emotionally they're still out of step, I like that they showed on the train fight that they're still physically in step, like fighting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was a great moment, the flirting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and it was fantastic. <laughs> like, let's like open we'll the volume die. strong. <laughs> also, I do like the the little like flashes of Adam they see here and there because you, as the audience, like don't know if they're actually seeing things or if he really is just like trailing them this whole time. Yeah. And then at the end, when you find out, oh shit, he was there the whole time. That was um, a great reveal. That was, there was oh. a lot of debate. I remember over that, or if he was real, or if they were just like experiencing PTSD. So that was a really really good. Oh, that must have been a real what the fuck moment for Yang, like after the fact, when she was like, mm -hmm. So I wasn't hallucinating him everywhere? She's like, like, oh fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Again, some real subtlety from this show for yeah. for in a rare move. Um all right. We gotta keep moving. Um, next moment we have to hit. The cute little moment they have in the woods, like when before Blake is going off to the tower. Yeah. Oh Aww. my god! Yeah, the gay little look over her shoulder. Oh, that moment is so incredibly the gay. Like, yeah, they were it's giving so each other. flirty. The flirt, they just flirt so much. I'm like, shut up, bitches! Like, stop. <laughs> and keep doing so it. Like, loud. Like, more, they're so loud. They're so loud. Yeah, I know. Like, what is, it that she, what is it that she says? Like, the um, uh, stealth. You're great. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you're great. And I'll hurry right back. Yeah. Oh, and just the like go, the go stop because and like that's a weighted moment too because you're like, here are two characters in which they something similar you know just happened where Blake left and did not come back right mm -hmm. and now Yang is like basically this is like where she's like implicitly showing us that she still trusts her enough to come back even after everything absolutely and it's like that's such a good moment like that was actually also, I think such an important moment yeah also the moment of her like being like go and then like smiling at her and then Blake running off and looking over her shoulder to like look back is like oh. like so like coded romantic you know oh, like yeah. that's it like is. out of an action movie or something it is so gay I remember there was <laughs> this is this is like kind of tangential but I just can't not think about this is that okay do you remember when everyone was freaking out because as Blake is like saying goodbye she does like a little thing with her hands she like mm. moves them up a little bit and someone like took a screen grab where it looks like she's doing the sign language for I love you oh, <laughs> I remember that. yeah so here's the thing though if you're doing the sign language for I love you on one hand oh that's cute like that that if that was like intentional that's a fun little detail she's doing it with both hands and I regret to inform you that if you do the sign language I love you on both hands. That's not I love you, that's Nico Nico knee. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. Um now okay. Cat girls stick together. I'm gonna be a little Okay, this isn't really spicy. This is just an opinion I have seen and I'm like, I love this scene, but I think there might be some validity here. Because I've seen some people say that like they're not a big fan of this scene because it feels like after the the scene in the barn or the storehouse or whatever, which ends on this, like, a very tense note. In this scene, it kind of feels like that tension was resolved off screen. Um, and now they're just, like, back to being on pretty good terms with each other, and they're just, like, laughing and joking around. Um, well, that... And so, like, by the time you get to, like, the moment at the waterfall, which we'll get to later, where you have the, like, we're protecting each other, which actually does resolve the 
um, tension from that previous conversation on screen, it feels like there's this sort of weird dip where it's like, oh, I guess this isn't a problem anymore. Oh, never mind. Now we have to finish this, I guess. Do, do you guys get what I'm saying? I, I do get what you're saying. But, but I yeah, but I think it's resolved. Because, well, in a way, the tension, at least, because I felt like as they were driving away from the estate, and they all have that moment of just kind of being like, I'm sorry, and blah, blah, and like realizing how much they were affected by what had happened and the lengths that they had gone to, I kind of felt that the tension between them there, they had attributed a lot to that. And yeah. so it kind of felt mm-hmm. natural that they would move past it because they were trying to move past the entire experience of everything that happened at that farm. Mm. Yeah, and even like at the farm, like as they're like running away, like they hold hands. Hand yeah, yeah, it's like, and I also think, yeah, my God, Margaret's a great point. It's like, we're forgetting that also Yang almost just watched Blake die, essentially. Yeah. And I think yeah. like, you know, cause you can see at that moment after Ruby uses her eyes or whatever, like Yang gets up and just stares at her. Like she doesn't even make a move for the door yet. And I think it's like one of those moments where you're like, that kind of put, I think that kind of puts some things into perspective. I think for Yang, especially considering she grabs her hand right after and like drags her out of there. So I think the tension does get resolved. I think the issue doesn't get resolved, but the tension does. Yeah, and I think there's kind of a disconnect there. Yeah, I don't know. I think that it's like the tension between them comes up whenever they try to discuss something deeper, but I think that they just don't go there again that we see, you know? Yeah, like, not until. It's, it's, like a, yeah. it's like a sore point. Like, yeah, like I think that Again, I liked when I said that they have, like, such physical synchronicity on the train fight. I think that on the surface, they're still getting along okay. But anytime one of them tries to dig a little deeper, then it gets awkward. And that mm. gets resolved to the waterfall. Yeah. And I but also I think, think, too, they like, work together well, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I also think the thing is, too, is that, like, obviously they are in love, right? Like, we're all kind of on the same page <laughs> yeah. at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that it's totally natural at this point that they are in this weird place and they are no matter what, like those feelings are there and they're going to sort of want to move past things to be together, like to just at least to be around each other. Like, so. But also those aren't the only feelings that are there. Like they also yes. have fun together and are friends. So they're yes. able to still access those feelings, you know? Like, yeah, I think it's just a very complex. There's a lot mm-hmm. going on. So I think it actually, I, I never found it weird that they kind of went back to this place after that because i felt like they went through something again that was like kind of traumatic and they were like okay like kind of enough <laughs> like let's i'm yeah. happy you're here at all <laughs> like i feel like they know they need to talk about something but it's not like they're fighting so when there's other yeah. stuff going on it's not like that's causing them to fight you know yeah. like yeah um okay last thing and the more the most important part of all of this the actual fight with adam um <laughs> I feel like, well, really anyone here, but especially Aaron, I feel like you could write, like, a whole fucking college thesis just on this scene. You are correct. Do you just want to, like, go off? Oh, my God. I actually, like, need a minute. Does someone else want to go off while Aaron collects her thoughts? I didn't even see in you! Like, like, there's not even a way to just, like... How, how do you even talk about it? It's like literally every single moment is like a fever dream. I was like, I did I imagine this? Did I write this? And I am somehow hallucinating <laughs> my own fic? Like, is this what just occurred? Like, <laughs> the amount of just like obviously romantic jealousy from Adam did blow my mind a little. I was like, oh, yeah. they're not even being a little bit subtle now, huh? Like, oh, I was subtle. freaking out at that line. <laughs> oh no, that line! I literally scream. Like, I scream. I remember screaming Me at that too. line, just like yelling. I don't even think I knew what happened after that for like t- like two minutes because I had just yelled and I was like not able to process sound anymore. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little moment before, like, right before Adam loses his shit, where Blake and Yang kind of, like, exchange a glance, and that just sets Adam off with, like, anger mm. kind of thing. Between both of them, and his face just changes. Yeah, it's like he sees what's happening, and it just, like, that's when he loses it. I'm like, yeah, that's, that was beautiful. Okay. I feel like we're talking about this in, like, a somewhat of a chronological order, or, like, this is the <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. So, yeah. first of all, can we just say, before we get into the real bumblebee of it all, um, Coatless Blake... Oh, right. We have to talk about Coatless Blake. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, you, Adam, for the service of cutting off Blake's coat. Yes, thank you, Adam. The one good thing he did. (laughs) That's not true. He also acted like a jealous ex. That's true. Also, other good thing that he did. He's a homophobic ally. Homophobic ally Adam Taurus. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, exactly. No, but Coatless Blake, uh, best look of all time. Um, I actually, I miss it every day. Mm Mm-hmm. 
It was a great oh, look. I've moment of silence for Oh, and the scar reveal. Mm. Oh yeah, because that was you a question, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, people were like, yeah, I remember like we used to hunt for the scar, like glimpses of it, and like going by. We used to be like, is it even? Is it there? Like, does she have one? And then this was like a very big reveal that they would it. The coat was removed, and it, we were like, oh my god, there it is. Mm-hmm. We knew. Is that what set off the like avalanche of scar fan art? Probably. Yes. Probably. Yeah. I could see that. No shortage mm-hmm. of that in this fandom mm-hmm. for sure. Um. Yes, coatless Blake was a highlight. I distinctly remember. Uh, there was uh, a week where like half my dash on Tumblr changed their profile picture to yes. coatless Blake pointing the gun. Yes, um, that was my dash where every single person had that icon. It was good cool. lord. Um, okay, right. Um, so that I also like a lot of like the choreography that um, Adam and Blake get on the tower where it's like there you get like a little he he feels like a bit more of a threat in that fight than he did previously which was one of my main issues with him in five where like you really feel like he's just around every corner and you don't know where he's coming from next and i like that element of like yeah yeah. no that was great you feel the fear in it you know yes you can definitely tell that blake was like running for her life like she was scared Mm mm-hmm and you need that I, for the the hit of the motorcycle to really feel like I yes, it does, right? It makes it all the more triumphant. Yeah, but it, but it also also like goes back to Bonnie because like Blake has always been like afraid to face him alone. Like even by when she stopped Sun going after him, she was like, "No, he'll pick us off one by one." That's right. What he wants. Like so, she always has known that he is a threat by himself. Like when it's like one on one or whatever. Like, um, and Blake like she I think waited. Just, like, I'm. And he Go waited ahead. for her to be alone, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Waited yeah. for her to be alone. And like and I think like obviously it's just we see in this scene like Blake's like extreme fear of him. Like she is literally afraid of him. And I think that is what makes him threatening, more so than just his power. It's just like the fact that she is so afraid. Uh, I'm losing my mind because I'm remembering that everybody was just like, What if he gets hit with the bike? I know. <laughs> <laughs> And we were all like that. that. They really went there. They really, they really hit him did. with the bike. They sure did. Also, the whole like, like you, what you guys were just talking about, where like, she didn't want to face him alone, and then the line before the bike hits him. Oh, sorry. Oh, 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 I know. Fantastic. Oh. All of it is so good. It's just yeah. great. Like Adam's whole speech, where he's clearly trying. I think they did a really good job with him, his speech to Blake as he's kind of like knocked her to the ground because it's like, it's him garnering for sympathy and also manipulating her. Like, and he's literally, that's like what we're witnessing him doing. Is he was like, I have been hurt. Look how badly I've been hurt, but you hurt me worse because you left me, even though I tried to kill you and also abused you and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. We get a real taste for what it must have been like when she was actually with him. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, but, like, the thing that I really like, too, is that we are looking at Blake in this moment, and she knows it's not true. Like, she has sort of, like, she knows what he's telling her is a lie now. And I feel like previously, like, obviously, when he talked to her in three, like, she was just, like, did not really know what to think. Like, she was a different person. So I think this is, like, another moment of growth is her, like, looking at Adam and seeing him say these things and, like, realizing she did not, like, deserve to be treated the way that she was treated. Definitely. Another cool thing I like about the scene is we get I mean this was something you could like read into before but they just go out and say it here is um the contrast between Yang and Adam's semblances Mm -hmm. yeah they mirror each other but the idea of like oh he can like store up all this power he can like take damage but he doesn't even have to feel it like Mm -hmm. there's so much to unpack there there's so much oh man um okay and then I think we can't move on without talking about we're protecting each other. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have. I feel we've so. No, I, mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and reverse yeah. bumblebee. Reverse Good bumblebee. Good shit. We need so much of that. Bumblebee. Oh, the reverse bumblebee. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wait. What were we, I'm sorry, Max. What did you say? What did you pop us on? I'm just <laughs> We're protecting each other. Yes. <laughs> we are protecting each other. I'm like, okay, the look, the little look Blake gives her before she said that she's, mm. that she's like, um, it's because she um, gets it, you know? She gets it. It's like, she finally gets it. Yeah, she's like, yeah. oh, I understand. Like, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I just like also the hero just landing. Like, playing the scene in my head. Hero landing. The hero. Yes, she does a full on oh. superhero landing. Oh yeah, that is a superhero landing. Oh my god. <laughs> um, also, the music is so crazy in that whole fight. Oh yeah, with like the like the like, drama. Yeah. The coral. I gotta, I gotta say, like, I really appreciate the soundtrack for um, the Bees versus Adam fight, just for like breaking from what Ruby normally does with their soundtrack. Um, not just because I think it sounds really good, but also it gives that scene like an added sense of like weight and importance. In that it's like, oh no, we're breaking out like the real soundtrack music for this. Like we're we're yes. we're abandoning the butt rock for just a little bit <laughs> to hype up oh. the drama. You know, uh -huh. the music is so good. I really, I really think this uh -huh. is like some of the most impactful the music has ever been. It's just like so good the way it, it like flows with the, with the actual scene and like the fights and the in between moments, like the emotional moments. Like it's just so good. Um, and then finally, at the very end. Well, okay. Do we have anything more to say about like the actual moment where they like kill Adam? Oh yes, I have so much to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just the fact, I just want to point out the fact that, like, Yang could not actually have grabbed that part of Blake's weapon if she did not have a, a, her prosthetic arm, because she's grabbing the blade. Because she's grabbing the able. blade. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that was so poetic, just, like, the fact that Adam has literally brought about his own destruction in these many, many different ways and, like, created, um, basically created what ultimately takes him down. Like, I just, the poetry. The poetry of it all. <laughs> It is so, it's incredible. I mean, so much, yeah. I just want to talk again, one more thing. Their auras are the colors of each other's eyes. <laughs> we only said that was such a big thing. We <laughs> speculated about this for so long in the fandom. Like, which, do you remember, like, how many times everybody was like, we've got to see Blake's aura? Like, like, there was so much speculation, and then, like, we had, like, all these theories about how, like, soulmates had matching auras and stuff like that, and then uh, we saw it, and everyone was like, <gasps> Oh yeah, we literally just screamed. We were so- it was such validation. Especially because, like, they're the only couple in the show that has that. Like, mm -hmm. Ren and Nora have the same aura color. Wait, what are Ren and Nora's aura colors? They're pink. Ren's aura is also pink? Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, yeah, from the same cloth. Okay. I know. It, which is also cute in a different way, which I actually also really like. Yeah. 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 Renora's valid. I like Renora. Um, need, they're adorable. Need also, to, they're like the Bumblebee parallel, so we kind of yeah, exactly. They need yeah. to figure their shit out in the next volume, but they that's do. that's a I'm really interested to see where that goes. Actually, we'll, they're kind of we'll get into that in the seven episode. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, let's finish off on that like last moment they have together, like oh after they've God. killed they Adam. The yeah. Oh. Right. Also, just like the sa the the satisfaction of of the just O of at where it like hits him. <laughs> he hits the rock. Especially, yes, especially because it's like the last thing he basically said was, you know, it's like, what does she even see in you? And then his final words are like, oh, oh I get it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like, ah, yeah. All right. <laughs> oh no, that final scene by the waterfall. Oh yeah, when they're just like foreheads touching, fellas, like, water hitting them. It's all about the comfort of the moment, guys. Mm. Fellas, is it gay if you tenderly embrace your partner next to a waterfall? <laughs> fellas, is it gay to tenderly touch your foreheads together after killing your abusive ex-boyfriend? The answer is yes. It's gay. <laughs> it's <laughs> super gay. <laughs> the fact that they have literally just been through this thing and just killed Adam. And the first thing Blake says is, I'm not going to break my promise. Like, that's the thing that is just at the forefront of her mind. Oh. Okay, that's but Adam crying. is throwing at her through that whole fight, too, yeah. right? Like, you're going to break your promise. Yes. So, yeah. So imagine how <sighs> twisted up she is the whole time. Mm -hmm. She's just like, needs she's like, her to know that. Like, oh, my God. But Yang knows she won't. Oh, wow. I'm going to die. I wonder if that will ever come up again. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Oh. The potential of them breaking the promise. That's the thing. I don't exactly know, like, I mean, I have a rough idea of what they can, where they can go with these two from here, but I don't mm. know exactly what they're going to hit us with in the sense that, like, they might, you know, create some more conflict and sort of drag this out longer. Um, I wouldn't like that. I feel like they've, they've dragged it out enough. My yeah. personal... I'd be, interested, I'd be interested in conflict after they get together, yes, though. I yeah, yeah, that's fine. But, like, mm -hmm. they've already been through, like, their big angst moment. So yeah. I think anything after this, it would just feel like 
a drag. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. There's something about this same like promise to stay like after they are together, I think would be interesting to revisit. Like a potential for breaking it. My personal theory is that they'll kiss in the last episode because I think that's oh, just... no way. It's gonna be way sooner no, than that. I don't, I don't think, think at all. Yeah, they're not gonna volume wait nine. Now. I'm saying volume Especially nine. But like Renora has already like had their moment, like Bumblebee is the logical next step. So. Yeah, no, I'm thinking <laughs> I think either this volume or volume nine. I'm with Merc. I'm yes. guessing eight. Wish, do you have thoughts on this? I want it to be eight. <laughs> uh, I mean, as much as I want it to be eight, since it seems like they're going to be spending like most of this volume like away from each other, sadly, um, I would say nine probably, or like the vacuo arc after like, you know, they see sun again. It sounds like, ah, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> like, I don't think it'll like, they'll, they won't necessarily be separated the whole volume. But yeah, like, we've only seen the first half of the volume. Right, right? yeah. The back half. Doesn't yeah, it take well, place over like, two days? The of V eight would be, I think, a good place for it. Um, I, I think that's. I think it'll be nine or vacuo arc. Like Coco brings them together. Oh, I'm gonna wait. <laughs> is, nine, is nine going to be vacuo arc? Oh no, are they eight and nine one volume? Uh, I think it's seven, eight are supposed to be the volumes that are kind of put together. Oh, so I we're, think vacuo isn't gonna be to volume ten. Like if we look at how they have split it up so far, that's true. All right, we're getting we're getting into like. Uh, yeah, eight eight and onward yeah. speculation. We got it. I think, all right, do we feel like we've hit all the important points here? Well, I mean, they're in love and... the, like the airship when they're like constantly just touching each other. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, wait, no. I love my gay yes. sister look. She yes. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. say. They sister yeah. look. <laughs> Where they embrace and they just have that that moment. Yeah, yeah. like Ruby is joining P Flag in that moment, is how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> I started hysterically laughing when she just like gave Yang the knowing stare. I, I know. know it was yeah. so funny to me. Uh huh. She's like, I know you're gay. So loud. Yang was like, maybe. maybe. Yeah, or um, when Weiss is like, I'm glad you guys had each other, and then they just give the softest little look to each other. And oh like, yes, and then they hold yeah. Yang takes her hand. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> we were there for Yang each other. Need to touch Blake all the time, but she does. Oh. Yeah, in Craft Volume 7 about that. They're constantly I mean, touching in that one. They were staring at each other a whole volume. Naturally, they're going to touch at the very end. I got to dig up the um, the meme of uh, Blake and Yang edited into the Yeah, we gay keep scrolling. <laughs> like the two oh. guns pointed at the camera. Oh, man. The little part of me holds they made out on that airship, and we just haven't heard about it. <laughs> oh, I know, Merc. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, for real. <laughs> All right. That was good. Uh, how long did we spend on that? We spent about 40 minutes on that. That was pretty good. <laughs> Honestly, not as bad as I thought it would be. Okay. <laughs> you did cut us off. I, you know, I gotta, like I said, I'm the kid in the group project who, like, does all the work. I gotta keep things on track. <laughs> um... We got some other smaller fun stuff to talk about in this volume. First of all, just that little scene at the beginning uh, when they're like, everybody's saying goodbye at the train station <laughs> with Neptune uh, going after Ilya. <laughs> the fact that Neptune sees any strange and is like, I better hit on this. I got to get my swerve on. <laughs> Neptune. <laughs> oh, wrong tree. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Got a good laugh out of that. Got a, a sensible yeah. chuckle. Um, well, and the classic and potentially controversial line right after where Sun tells her. Don't, there's there's a slide for that. There's a slide. No, okay. <laughs> that has a slide. Um, the Pira Memorial. Oh, oh I cried. Yeah. I definitely but, cried. So I've watched this volume about like 80 times now. Um, and I've never really like like welled up during that, but the last time I rewatched, I just broke down crying during that memorial Aww. scene, like sobbing like a baby. It was crazy. The music that plays is so sad. Yeah. And the return of um, what's her name? The voice actress. Mm. I don't know what her name's. Mm. Jen. Jen Brown. Jen Brown. Jen Brown. That's who it is. I get her and Jen Taylor mixed up. But... Is she the mother? Yeah, she's the mother. Ah. Uh, I don't think we know that. Well, we no, don't know that the mother, but the voice actress, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've yeah. got to assume that Kira's mother. I mean, right? come on. <laughs> yeah. Sister. 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 A, a, a milfy older sister. Maybe. Perhaps. So, in your milfs. <laughs> dark horse ship for uh, winter in the later volume. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> dark horse. 
I can't. We'll do we'll do Merc's crack <laughs> ships. We got Merc. There's plenty of time for crack shipping on the gin volume, um, oh. or the gin slide. Uh, okay. okay. Get, getting back on track. I think this moment is like it's really important because it does come back to like why Pira's death was important thematically. Um, Mm -hmm. because I think that is something that needed to be, like, reinforced in this context and sort of, like, bring everyone out of the despair that they were put into by the revelation that, like, Salem can't be killed. Um, and how it, like, all sort of ties together in that way is, like, really nice. The beat of Juniper, like, being there for each other is really nice as well. Like, we miss her too when Nora kind of says that. Yeah. I also like that Pierre just still has such a presence in the show. Like I feel like a lot, a lot of shows, like when a character dies, you you don't get this kind of service. Yeah, you know, that charm has given <laughs> Pierre, and I like really appreciate that. Yeah, comes back to like what I was talking about in the volume four episode about how like this is a show that forces you to grieve more mm-hmm. than like pretty much any other show I've watched, especially in this genre. Um, and the amount of you know, they, they really make you feel the loss of this character um, in a way that, again, continues to impact the story, like, years later, which is really impressive and very, very good to see. Mm-hmm. Um, other good stuff. I like the moment where, like, okay, because Crow goes through a whole, like, Doomer arc this uh, volume because he realizes that, like, all of his life's work has been for nothing, or at least that's how he perceives it. Um... And I really like the moment, like, there's a few of these starting at, like, the house they're in and then later um, out when they're on, like, before they fight the robot, but, like, after, when the plan gets scuttled, um, because Blake gets ambushed, um, with Ruby standing up to Crow, both because Mm -hmm. it, like, it's obviously, like, in character in the sense that, like, Ruby's whole thing is trying to, like, be the light in the darkness and... Crow at this point is just sinking into just like, I guess, either nihilism or pessimism, depending on how you're framing it. It's a little of both. Um, but I think it's really interesting that they have Ruby stand up to Crow because she looks up to him so much. Um, yeah. Yeah. And mm-hmm. like she says, you have to trust me. I like to think that maybe like in that scene that where she says, you have to trust me, that it, maybe Summer said something very similar right before she died, too. Ooh. But that's rough. Ooh. 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 I also had a thought, like, how much was Ruby reminding him of Summer in certain moments that I thought was, yeah. it's very interesting. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Um, when I was watching this volume, I thought this would be, like, the lowest point we saw Crow at, kind of, like, his sort of emotional bottom. Ah. I just don't think that anymore. <laughs> oh, Crow. <laughs> Mm -hmm. just doesn't have a good time um, yeah but like on a more interesting note like I mean not interesting but like positive I guess is Quo is like you see him failing Ruby in so many ways like through this volume but he is still there to catch her at the very end too like Mm -hmm. like, it's not all lost for him that's that's Mm -hmm. that's the like arc is like he has to he goes all the way down then you see him coming back up at the end um yeah but yeah, it's interesting that, like, you know, Ruby learned so much from Crow. She styled herself after him, like, pretty blatantly. Um, and then at the very end, he has to learn something from her. And that's just yeah. neat. Well, a lot of the um, the writers and staff of the show, when they talk about thematically, they say volume six is about, like, the younger generation realizing the adults won't be there for them, right? Mm. So Crow mm. is kind of the stand him for a he lot probably, of that. He's, he's got that like, moment, too, with Maria, like... She yeah, was the hero of his generation. So that little bit at the end with them was God. Imagine meeting your hero and she thinks you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> this volume was very much passing the torch kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, good, good stuff, good stuff. Also, on the note of like, please let something good happen to Crow. God, I feel like this is Crow is what happens when you construct a character entirely out of death flags, but refuse to kill him. Yes. <laughs> At this point, I think Crow's just going to make through the series, like... Out of spite. Yeah, exactly. Spite. Literally. He'd be like, I made it through all of this. Oh, my son goes. When all that stuff happened with Vic, I was like, they're going to kill him. They're going to kill him. I thought they might. They kill him. Oh, God. They just gave him a boyfriend instead. <laughs> oh, we'll get, uh, save it for seven. Um, another cool thing, uh, Cinder and Neo get new outfits, and they look great. Yeah, I, don't, I don't Very like winter appropriate. Outfit. 
much. I like Neil Gold outfit better, I think. And they're coming out with her, like, Gucci stiletto heels. Yes. <laughs> like, no pants look. Her Atlas. Mm. Plus couture. It's, it's more of a pussy out look. <laughs> <laughs> That's Cinder. That oh, yeah. never gets cold. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, she's too hot to feel the cold. Um, and then also, last thing, because we didn't talk about this before, um, during the big kaiju battle at the end, um, the uh, one of my favorite moments in the whole show is Ruby using Jin to stop time so yes. that she can charge up the silver eyes. Um, oh, yeah. That was kind of smart. Well, I remember when you see Ruby as a tactician, right? Like, anytime you see her doing strategic moves, it's it's awesome. Some of my favorite, like, moments in any kind of, like, shounen or, like, fight-based anime is anything that's, like, very, um, where it's not so much because a lot of shows revolve around, like, you know, getting some new power or finding some burst of inspiration that lets you, like, fight through whatever, right? The thing that always gets me is whenever the thing that wins the fight is, like, using whatever tools you already have available in novel and interesting ways. Mm-hmm. Like, that's where... You find where... a loophole. Sorry? You find the loophole. Exactly. Yeah. That's, those are always, like, my favorite kind of fights, or, like, my favorite way to resolve a fight, and this is, like, a fantastic example of that, because you wouldn't even think of, like, oh, yeah, Jin stops time, so you could just use her to do that. But, uh, yeah, super clever. It's interesting finding Ruby doing um, loopholes with like godlike figures when you see uh, Salem being taken down for that. <laughs> Jin lets her off with a warning. <laughs> I'll allow it, but watch yourself, McCoy. That whole scene is so good. Like it's so emotional. Like the flashbacks and the music. Summer. Like, Summer. Oh, I really like nuts. I cried. Like, I, I cried too. Like I was with. We were watching with Alana and. We were book- we were crying. Yeah, the scene like seeing Penny was like a uh, hit in the gut for me. Oh. <laughs> nope, for me, hit was when they're all like it's like a little flash in it, but it's all of them in their beacon uniforms, jumping in the air, pumping their fists. Aww. I don't know why that one got me, but it did. Um, not actually a lot to complain about this volume. I'll be honest that we we couldn't fill up the bad section so there's only one slide um (laughs) but you know there's always things to nitpick so we might as well um i think one minor complaint about this volume is that and these kind of tie into each other a salem's crew basically spends the whole volume hanging and chilling um they don't really have anything to do right now because they're just basically prepping for uh volume seven uh, and because of that, the only real villain we get, aside from, you know, the apathy and Adam, who we've already covered, is Cordovan, who's kind of weak and is mostly just a joke. Um, and, you know, there's, it's, it's like, again, Ruby has sort of a recurring problem with villains, and I think that just sort of ties into it. I was thinking about Salem's crew chilling, right? Like, they're just back at the evil continent castle or something hanging out. But that, uh scene with mercury and emerald i love that scene i have to say like mm. oh yeah you like that scene too yeah like it's one of my faves for sure like i sort of root for mercury after it i'm definitely interested to see where they go with that um in the sense that like you know there's going to be some sort of like falling out between like because like okay volume eight presumably emerald and mercury are gonna be there so there could potentially be a cinder there could be a Team Seaman reunion, or excuse me, t- oh, Team C- Cumin. Cinnamon. Team Cumin. That's what we settled oh, on. Uh, all right, Cumin. There could potentially be a Team Cumin reunion, and I'd be interested to see how that goes down. I feel like it's going to well. No. <laughs> but yeah. Um, but yeah, I think Cordovan's like mostly just there for as an excuse to have a giant robot fight, which. I mean, it's Ruby. What do you expect? I mean, Cordovan's character is also there to show, like, Ruby's influence on people, I think. To, like, mm-hmm. show how infectious her sense of hope is. They had to... Sorry. I, I'm just gonna say the giant robot fight, they had to make a Gurren Logan reference. That's what that was. It was a Gurren Logan reference and a Pacific Rim reference. It was. 
And also, I think it's just to show sort of the attitude of Atlas. I think Cordova mm-hmm. was sort of like an example of what we were going to see from Atlas next volume, or like what the attitude was of the people. Gotcha. Like that certain might versus nothing. Yes. Like, yeah, absolutely. My way or the highway. Yeah. yeah. And that they'll hit you with just like a bigger thing, no matter what you do. Not necessarily a more clever fight, but definitely a heavier, bigger one. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Um, another minor nitpick. Um, I know that this has been explained in like Q and A's and shit, but there's that scene where Ruby shows up with a bag from the gift shop. She's like, guess what I got everyone. And then she doesn't say what it is. And then they cut the scene where we see what it is. And I know she got friendship bracelets. It was friendship bracelets. I think we're going to, we're supposed to see them in the future, right? Oh, they are going to bring that back. I thought they were going to bring that back. I thought they were like, yes, you will see that. I would be very thankful if they did, because I want to see that scene. But I um, love the friendship bracelets. There's a really cute comic about the friendship bracelets. Oh, the Frankie Lucky one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very cute. And she tied a little sunflower pop tab into it. I got to get around to reading the DC comics. I hear they're really good. They're pretty good. Yeah. Especially if you're a Bumblebee fan. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. I Yeah, because I I talked to my friend who's like actually into comics about this. And she was like, oh, yeah, they got like a really good writer for that series. So it's uh, I'll have to check that out eventually. Um, Last note. Um, I think Adam's, like, the reveal of the Schnee Dust Company brand is actually kind of weak. Like, you know that something was behind the mask, and you're not sure exactly what it is. And, like, I don't know if there was anything that could have, like... I don't know if there's a way that could have been, like, more impactful, but it just feels like you sort of see it, and then it, it they don't really do anything with that. Like, will it be followed up in the future? Is yeah. There's, like, there's, like, there's, like, I actually moment in V7 that, like where Blake like looks at the this SDC logo and kind of, I think she gives Yang a look maybe, but it's like a tiny little moment. But yeah. I kind of also got the impression that that's because it's the mine that Ilya's family was in. Yeah, oh, that's, that's what it was. True, yeah. I also do, I do feel like it's something that they will come back to. That was always my impression, but I did find it impactful at the time because I actually did not yeah. expect that whatsoever. I was like, holy shit. Well, that complicates things. But I'm just wondering how will it complicate things? Like, it, right now, it's kind of just a hanging thing. Like, I wonder how that will be followed up on now that yeah, I think, Adam's I, tied up. I think exactly. I think we'll just have to... This one of the things I think we still kind of have to wait and see. Mm-hmm. Like, what happens yeah, with it. That's true. It's, like, possible that they might bring it back later, but I also would not be surprised knowing how much Miles and Carrie hate Adam <laughs> if they yeah. do all they can to just forget about that. Um, but, like, if you want to forget about that, why introduce that extra layer is what I would ask. That's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Point is, we don't... This is all of our favorite volumes. So, uh... <laughs> all right. It's discourse time. First of all, uh, Ship Wars. There were a lot of them in this show, uh... It's one of the things that Ruby, I think, is the most infamous for. I always tell the story that, um... I went to Katsucon 2020, the last con before the pandemic, baby. Um, and I went to a panel at that con that where the premise was basically uh, these the panelists would take votes from the audience of like, all right, what's a what's like a franchise that people get mad about shipping in? And they pick mm-hmm. one. They'd pick one, they'd have one audience member come up to argue for one ship, they'd have another audience member come up to argue for another ship, and then they'd duke it out, and then the audience would vote on which person they agreed with more. Um, oh so there were only, and but I think they said, like, there were four fandoms that they said you're not allowed to do, um, and those were homestuck, because I think they just didn't want to, like, deal with it. Um, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure... <laughs> <laughs> because apparently everyone would make the the I don't know if y'all have seen JJBA, but the the scene where uh, the fake Kakyoin does the everyone did that during the debate, and they got so sick of it that they said no more <laughs> no more JoJo's. Um, Harry Potter, and of oh. course, of course, and of course, Ruby and oh. oh my god and ruby and harry so potter funny. were banned because people they brought up got into physical altercations over god. their ships that's so funny <laughs> people are so stupid and physical altercations 
physical altercations. They threw hands over ruby ships, and I guarantee you it was Bumblebee Black Sun because <laughs> it is it, that's the one that would cause people to throw hands. Uh Hilarious. Okay, so gang in winter or something like. <laughs> okay, so the crux of this discourse is basically the idea that over volumes one through five, but especially like um in four and five, I'd say the idea was that the show was sort of like building towards Black Sun Endgame, was building towards Blake and Sun getting together. And then volume six, it swerves hard in a different direction, and suddenly it becomes obvious that they are now trying to get Blake and Yang together. This is just sort of this is this is the the, the, the this is the narrative. Oh my gosh! Um, <laughs> oh my god! All right, now, <laughs> keep. Uh, oh god, I don't. You, you all know what you're dealing with here. Just know my audience are not all bumblebee shippers, so please be please be <laughs> oh, yeah. please be civil. Um, yep. who would like to start? I would love to start. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear it. probably going to do it. We are all messy bitches who live for drama. Aaron? I'm going to not be offensive. Here's all I'm going to say. Okay. Which I say all as if it's not going to be quite a lot. Um, that narrative is, is so heteronormative. So people don't understand. Like, the only people who thought that the show was building to Black Sun were people who shipped Black Sun. Like they were it was kind of a case where like there were people who were going to see what they wanted to see um i think something can't be forced if the people who it is representing saw it there from the beginning like we are queer women like we saw bumblebee from the beginning as something that we felt was going to be endgame or was going to happen or whatever and like we were right about that and it's not because the show forced it it's because we were seeing something that other people either did not want to see, are not used to seeing, didn't expect to see, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, it has always been there. And like, th that's justified by just the amount of times we could go back to earlier volumes and go back to arcs and be like, this was always the case. Like, this was always going to happen. Um, like, Bumblebee is queued up from volume two, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it 100% is. And so it's like when people are, are saying, you know, this was force, what they are really saying is we don't respect the experiences um, of queer women who saw this coming. Like, we saw it coming because it was obvious to us, because like, this is what it looks like for us or whatever. Like, so I think that's something that people don't think about in this debate is that it's not, there wasn't something was force and it wasn't that something was leading to something else. Like, it's that this was here and, if people had maybe listened to us like slightly earlier or at literally any other point when we were like, hey, this is reflecting what we are used to in like our own lives and this is reflecting something we're familiar with, then this probably would not have been a debate because we always knew it was there. And honestly, I think you could probably make several of those arguments in the favor of Black Sun if you wanted to for the first few volumes. But Black Sun was like intentionally diffused in the Sun Goodbye conversation. And Bumblebee has never been intentionally diffused in that way on screen. I also think like with Black Sun, like they actually, they did a lot to sort of not like shut it down, but like Blake was not interested in Sun more than she was interested in him. Yes. Like, like the number of times she d literally did not want him there or was not interested in talking or told him he didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Like those were very clear signals that I think like what happened is from the beginning, like Blake saw Sun as somebody who could be an ally and understand her at a time when she did not have that, when she felt like she didn't have that back in, you know, volume two and et cetera. Like she was like, the, had been just reveals the finest, did not have anybody else who got her in that way. And then there was Sun. Oh, he was a boy. He liked her, et cetera. Well, like, of course, it's like a very natural, you would think. Sure. Mm -hmm. But then obviously as it goes on, like we see that they are really not compatible. Like they, they're great as friends. And like, I love Sun. Like, I don't want people to think that we are sitting here and like, we hate Sun and blah, blah, blah. Like, I love him. I think he's a great character. He's a lot of fun. Same. Mm -hmm. um, but like, it is very obvious that like they, that he does not get her in the way that she wants. And the person who, you know, the person who probably does understand her a little more is like, yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of what the relationship in four and five is about that, about how they are great friends, but they aren't compatible beyond that. Yeah, exactly. It's mm -hmm. like, and like Blake makes a direct comparison many times. Like Blake literally parallels Sun and Elia multiple times in volume mm -hmm. four. 
So it's like they do so many things to make it clear that the way Blake is seeing Sun, especially after Volume 3, like in my opinion, they shut down Black Sun at the end of Volume 3. Like I, I don't think, in my mind, it was never a possibility after that because the way they literally linked Blake and Yang together permanently from that moment was so clear and so romantically coded that I was like, there's literally no other way they can go with this. Um, it, it is interesting that Sun's direct parallel is Ilya, where Yang's direct parallel is Adam. Adam. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and like all these things were done on purpose. So it's kind of like, yes, on the surface, like Sun was a boy who was interested in Blake and Blake was interested for a shorter period of time. But that's it. Like that is but like literally make like, all make off. like Sun has already done and let it go is kind of how I feel. Yeah, yeah, like Sun let it go. Like he was like, I see where this is going. Like he he literally makes it clear where he's like, it was not about that. And I think for a lot of us, we were like, yes, that's very clear. It wasn't about that because Sun didn't ask for that. He was really trying to be a friend. And I actually respect that a lot more. No, I absolutely agree. I do think the door is open for Black Sun in volumes one and two, though. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. And I think yeah. at that point it was like... I, I get the Black Sun shippers. I totally understand it. Not, oh, yeah. not just on the level of character you identify with plus character you think is hot, but also like again, like the setup that was there or what was there in volumes one and two in the sense of like leaving the door open. I also think sort of looping back to Aaron, your point about heteronormativity, I think for a lot of people- I have to say something about this. No, okay. wish, get in there, wish, get in there. <laughs> okay, okay. So back when, back when Ruby started, I thought I was straight. So clearly <laughs> I was just like, I know, right? Crazy. <laughs> so clearly, um, when I started to see Sun and Blake, I was just like, oh, so that's going to be Endgame, probably. But that was just because it was a boy and a girl, and they were just mm -hmm. talking to each other. So I automatically equated that with, like, oh, that's the way the show was heading. I had never actually seen it go through where it was, like, a gay ship, like, totally go through to the end. So I automatically assumed that was not going to happen. And that was that was just heteronormativity. Like, that was what got me there. Um, and then after volume three, I was like, well, that seems not straight. And then <laughs> Fellas. it just kind of evolved from there. And I got more and more convinced that maybe I wasn't imagining it, which it kind of just broke through the hetero in me. And yeah, so definitely. That's straight baited. That's a splack sun. I wonder. <laughs> I, straight baited. I, this, is, this is a weird question. I wonder how many girls have like, <laughs> have watched Ruby and it's like awakened something in them. <laughs> I mean, a lot. For sure. I think it's a not insignificant number. It is half this panel. <laughs> and I mean, but the, like, that's the thing I think also is like, this is such a common thing. Like, I only started thinking about it because I watched South of Nowhere when I was like 12 or 13. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. And it's like, that's kind of the narrative you hear a lot is that when people get to see themselves reflected, they realize they're seeing themselves. <laughs> And I think like Ruby is a really good example of that. Like I know so many people who have been like, I only, I thought I was straight. And then I started watching Ruby and I was like, why do I love this relationship so much? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, um, I think in previous episodes when Rio was on, they were telling you guys that I was very much of the idea that I didn't think it was going to happen because I had never seen it happen before. Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason why I didn't ship it. And I was pretty much on like the fence that Black Sun was actually going to be, be canon. So like, it, it straight glasses. I was seeing the world with straight glasses. So if Black Sun is an intentional straight bait red herring, is that mean to Black Sun shippers or is it innovative because it's like a gay double cross? <laughs> it's both. I, both. It's I don't, both. I don't even think it's either. Like I think it was I think it's just like an actually like a really good narrative arc. Like I think it's like Blake was was looking for something and thought she found it and then found it in somebody else. Like that's a classic story and I love it. <laughs> There's so much of what Blake would see in Sun that she might think she sees in Yang and vice versa as well. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. parallels between them as well. Yeah, but I think there's a, not necessarily depth, because of course Sun has depth, but there's a, a kind of depth to Yang that I think speaks to Blake a bit more. Oh, yeah, I mean, especially after yeah. that volume two conversation, like after burning the candle, like, yeah. Absolutely, like, yeah. you know, Sun spends that whole time trying to be like, what's wrong with Blake? And then Yang is like, uh, well, I'm going to go talk to her because I know exactly what's wrong. Mm. Yeah, and she like, knows how to peel back Blake's layers in a way that Sun clearly yeah, doesn't. Yeah, like Sun has kind of never known that. Like Sun kind of has forced his way in. I mean, not in a bad way, 
just that's what he's had to do because they can't really relate to each other. In okay, well, in, in there, I think she needed that. I think she needed yeah, someone. No, no, to I, I guess, yeah, yeah, in in fairness, Sun actually does a lot for Blake's character development, especially in no, volume no, four. Totally. Oh, yeah. So like yeah, no, he, we love Sun. he does yeah, no, like, yeah, no, I he, agree. he gets he her on some level, just not this particular level. <laughs> yeah. I think he I think the thing like they don't they can't really relate to each other. Like is the thing. Like he he helps her a lot because he's kind of he can kind of see this big picture of like especially you know the earlier he's like you are hurt you're actively hurting yourself yes and i want to stop that from happening because you don't deserve it and that's sort of what he operates off of and like i think he does a ton for her in that because he literally will not let her like continue basically sabotaging herself which is extremely important but i don't think that the same intimate connection you know like yeah but the lower layers Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he like when you go low, when you get down there, it's kind of like that. That connection is missing. Yeah, mm-hmm. thinking about the lyrics of like "Morning Follows the Night." Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's uh the outside perspective versus being able to like relate directly to like mm-hmm. um the other person's experiences. I think it's kind of what we're I getting do, at. I do feel like they left it open where it could go either way though for a while because they weren't sure which way they wanted to swing it, but like. I like, if it had like, been really hated, they were like, we can fall back on Black Sun. Pretty much, I think. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I never had that. I literally saw Volume 3, and I was like, nope, they're doing it. Volume 3... You cannot read this scene literally any other way. That was definitely the the volume where I remember, like, up to this point, I thought, like, all right, there's, like... I mean, I went in shipping Bumblebee because, like, yeah. I came here from the Yuri fandom, so, of course, I was a Bumblebee White Rose shipper. But, um... The, like, I thought Black Sun was, like, a very real possibility. And then at that scene, I was like, all right, it's, they could still very much do Black Sun, but I was sort of, like, you know, pulling up my chair and getting out my popcorn, like, all right, this could get interesting. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, this yeah. this might be real. Um, I will say, looping back to the idea of, like, this is kind of heter- heter- heteronormativity and kind of just, like, I guess, tropes and playing around with tropes. I think yeah. a key reason why... Um, like, so many people feel like Black Sun was, like, clearly led up to and the the turn away from it was extremely sort of sudden is because just the, the basic idea of uh, a girl meets a guy who hits on her and she sort of rolls her eyes but then over time warms up to him is, like, such well-established territory yeah. in that if you oh, see two yeah, characters if you see two characters acting like that you can comfortably assume they'll get together the i need to like cut in because like the first joke that yang makes at blake she rolls her eyes anyway <laughs> <laughs> um but like like for example for a video uh, I did recently. I had to watch all of V slur and wall oh, God. and in like one of the first episodes, uh what was it? It's Lance, right? Yeah, Lance, like right after they meet Allura. Yeah, right after they meet Allura, he starts hitting on her and she has no interest whatsoever. I'm like, fuck, they're gonna get together, aren't they? God damn it. And lo and fucking behold, they do in the very end. So it's like so many shows and so many in movies and books and everything follow this exact pattern that like yeah you could see two characters acting like that and just be like oh obviously they're endgame like there's no other option and i know the well has been kind of poisoned on this term but i think this is actually an example of like subverting expectations because yeah that's a storyline we've seen a million times but there's no reason it should end like that like, why can't they just so be it's innovative? Yeah, why can't they just be friends and you know go their separate ways? It's the big gay double cross. <laughs> I I do like the idea of a boy and a girl can be good friends too, because that doesn't happen very often. Yes. So. Ah, especially when they've had a previous like romantic interest. Like, I feel like we never see that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's an I I appreciate that representation as like a dude who like half of my best friends are just my exes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I also just really like that, like, the show was like, Sun can help her and not expect anything from her. I feel like yes. that's something we never see. That's something and, that a lot of 
a lot you know, of I uh, think like discourses I've seen about it were just like okay, but he went through all of these lengths to help her, so she should be interested in him. him. Like she, you know, like, said, yeah, I put, said that too. Uh, you know, put nice things, coins, and girl until she likes it. Uh, yeah, okay. yep, yeah, yeah. That's a nope. Nope. Yeah, and so I like love that it was son. They were like, no, like it's not about that. Like you know, he he he's her friend, and he wanted to help her, and she doesn't owe him anything for that. Indeed. All right, let's move on. Um, this okay. I love the scene. I'm putting it in the discourse slide because there's just a lot of stuff to like debate here. Um, the is it episode three? I forget what it's called. The Lost Fable. That's the name of the episode. I think it's three. Yeah. It's a three. Oh, that was four. Four, yeah. Uh, might be four, yeah. Doesn't matter, I guess. Um, okay. The Lost... It's in the first quarter. It's the big info dump episode where Jin explains all the lore to them. Um, but it's done as a flashback, which I think is smart as well. Oh, I love this episode. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. This was done well, I think. Everyone loves a flashback. People don't always love an info dump, so... Yes. You know we were doing. For lore. We were <laughs> looking for the lore drop, and then it just happened. And it was so good. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, oh, fuck the gods. <laughs> yeah, fuck them. He coming, the so coming back to something I said earlier about, like, you can do exposition if you just make it visually interesting. I think this episode is the perfect example of this because the visuals are so stunning in this. Um, and it really helps, like, carry the episode and, like, you know, sort of, like, make it a lot easier to digest the fact that we're just watching a 23-minute flashback. Flashbacks are always good. I think you don't... Only a 23 minute flashback. Flashbacks are the best. Like, mm. That's the best way to dump lore, I think. Yeah, and like for this particular flashback, like I don't think it really could have been done any other way without, like, I don't know, like, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a lot of fucking information. You gotta get it out somehow. Right, yeah. yeah. As a side note, I have watched this episode so many times trying to feel, see if there's like thematic parallels, which with with uh, which character is watching each part of the storyline, and nothing's added up yet to anything interesting, but I'm going to keep trying. (laughs) You're going to come through with the college-length essay on this. Yeah, exactly. I'll connect those dots. You are very good at that. Um, (laughs) Okay, so aside from just, like, getting all our questions answered, I think the big juicy thing to dig into here is, uh, is Oz been a good person? Do we like him? You know what's weird is Oz Pin, in terms of Ozma is kind of such a victim of his circumstances. Like yeah. he's very inactive in his own lore. Like he kind of just is there, fulfills the role of hero, dies, and then is brought back and told you have to do this now. Like yeah. Balaam is much more active in this backstory than Oz ever is. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. I think I'm not okay. I think like it Ozpin is one of those characters who I think they actually do pull off as being like morally gray in the sense yeah. that most mm-hmm. Most of what he is, is he is very much a product of his circumstances um, in the sense that he didn't really ask, he didn't ask for this. They just sort of forced this role on him and gave him what is like functionally, um, and you know, he later learns that it literally is an impossible task that he has to do literally forever. Um, And so the fact that that's like fucked him up a bit and made him paranoid and screwed with the way that he interacts with people, I think is pretty understandable. Obvious, yeah. Obviously, it's, like, hurt the characters in this way, and it's caused a lot of problems, but, like, I get it. His motivations make sense, and I think fundamentally he still does want to do good in the world, and he does want to help people. He just is kind of lost as to how. Well, and you see the weight of how many cycles he's gone through. Like, I always think of, in that episode... When he says, like, do you think Leo was the first to betray me? Like, no, mm. he's gone through, like, 900 lives. He's probably seen every form of, like, being screwed over in the book. Like, no wonder he's shady. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like, I, I think Austin is just, like, he's he's trying, really. I think I think what the show did that is interesting is, like, rather than make really Salem the ultimate evil or Ozpin actually secretly evil or blah, 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 whatever... They really just made, like, the gods fucking assholes. They were like, actually, it's not really these two people. It's the people who put them in these circumstances that are the true enemy. Do you think Endgame will be to fight the gods? Like, I think Ruby should be god killers is my... Yeah, I think so, too. Dude, dude, I... I 
I have a friend uh, who I've mentioned many times before, Amelia Divine Noodles, who's like written a few of my videos. She's really cool. If you like Bandori, go check out her fix on AO3. But um, she's like kind of neutral on Ruby right now and that she likes some stuff about it, but has a lot of other hangups. And, but she has like this personal like obsession with the idea of killing God um because she she was like a comparative religion major and just thinks that's really fascinating and so if they actually end up killing the gods <laughs> i can get another ruby friend and i am <laughs> very excited at that prospect um the gods are assholes they really they're are they're just dicks they're, they're just abandoned remnant after all that too so like they just what? like the fact alone that they just like brought Ozma back to life in Salem's arms and took him away like three hundred times in front of her and was like, "This is fine. They're absolutely not going to traumatize this grieving woman." They literally have oh, such man. hatred for her specifically. They kill off all of humanity just to spite her. Oh my god! Well, and the no. god of light, the god of light, didn't punish her for asking for this. She, he punished her for going to his brother. Yeah, and like going behind his back, right? Like, yeah, he's, he's just petty. like a, they're just both dicks. Like, like. Yeah, like if he was going to punish her for asking for this, then he would have done it after she asked. He waited until she offended him. Like, in a p very petty way, I thought. So, yeah, yeah. God of Light, douche. God of Darkness, also douche. Yeah. Salem has done nothing wrong. This, yeah, I think. I know. Justice for Salem. I know. Um, for Salem. Pug has complained in previous episodes about Salem feeling like this sort of vague, looming evil, but I really think that this episode goes a huge way to cr giving her a complete character that is actually really interesting, because, mm -hmm. like, she, I think, is better fleshed out than any other villain at this point. I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say, except, oh, may yeah. except maybe Ironwood, oh, yeah. but, you know. If Ironwood's a slow boy, it's volume seven. <laughs> exactly. Um, Salem, you get it all at once. Salem shows, like, like I think that the creativity she kind of shows in, like, trying to circumvent the gods reminds me so much of Ruby, like Ruby Rose. Mm. Mm. So I'm, like, interested to yeah. see if that goes anywhere. They should team up and kill God together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's how she figures well, it out. That would be a great way to end the show. That yeah. would be endgame. That'd be awesome, actually. <laughs> I love or it. Even just some, like, we're not so different after all, like moment or i don't know it'll be it'll be like the reverse it's it's the reverse we're not so different after all we're like normally oh god ruby what if ruby beats salem with talk no jutsu that's like a very real possibility do you guys know what i'm talking about i do not no, not no. Kind of okay sorry talk no jutsu is a joke that originates in naruto fandom where basically mm -hmm. it refers to a running theme in which naruto will uh defeat one of his enemies, not by, like, killing them or, like, actually beating them into submission, but by fighting them really, really hard and then, like, talking to them to, like, show them the error of their ways. And then eventually they're like, ah, yes, you're right. I, I've been, uh, I've made a terrible mistake. I need to stop. Um, and, like, the joke is that Talk No Jutsu is his most powerful ability because he wins so many fights that way. That's so funny. Um, <laughs> and you see that, that's in a lot of shows. Um, and I would, I would not at all be surprised if Ruby ends up doing that to Salem since, and I this- mean, that's how she beats Cordovan, basically. Yeah, yeah, actually a little bit. Um, well, they also kick Cordovan's ass, but, you know, afterwards. Um, I, no, she- it's really hard, and then she gives the speech, and then Cordovan helps them. Comes in, comes well, in. No, with, then the can happens. Yeah, she comes in with the Gurren Lagann drill at the end. It's fine, but this ties into the other big bombshell from this episode, which is Salem can't be killed, or can she? Um, personally, I think Austin cannot kill her. Yeah, I think I think they're personally leaving that open. I think that phrasing, because here's the thing: Jin is a genie, and genies are notoriously very. Uh, uh, picky about the way you phrase things. Monkey's mm -hmm. paw esque. Exactly. So I would not be surprised if you can't just means Ozpin can't kill her, but other people could. Well, yeah. I mean, Nora then raises that in volume seven already, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. Um, but yeah, just I there's a lot of stuff here that I think sets off some really interesting theories about where the show could go from here. Um, it's, yeah, it's a lot, a lot of good stuff. Also, this is the beginning, and we touched on this a little bit before, of please let one good thing happen to Crow. <laughs> I swear to God, this man is so sad. <laughs> Poor Crow. He deserves better. He really does. Get get Crow a boyfriend, for the love of God. Can't help it, it's his son. 
Preferably yes. one that isn't a cop. Oh, yes. <laughs> Two. He meets the right guy and he's a cop. That's his semblance exactly. in action. There's a, yeah. Any any relationship. Still got, he's still got Ironwood in the future. He's also, he's also technically kind of a cop. Yeah, he's he's a dictator, fair. which is worse. Well, maybe they'll run away to patch together. <sighs> Open up a tiki shop. <laughs> get, get Crow a boyfriend. Anyway. Yeah, for sure. All right, we have to get into the bad stuff here. We're we're getting into the real nasty part of this episode, um, because in between volumes six and seven, if I recall correct, yes, this was after volume six. Um, people found some reviews on the Rooster Teeth Glassdoor page. Um, Glassdoor, if you've never used it, is a website where employees can leave reviews of companies they've worked at. And there's a bunch of other stuff you can do on there too. It's like a job search website. But uh, these reviews were extremely negative and there were a lot of recurring themes across them that suggested that this wasn't just like one or two people who had a bad time and were particularly salty, but instead this was a massive issue with Rooster Teeth's animation department that was uh, systemic and had gone unaddressed for many years. Um, and these accounts were later confirmed by other people who had worked with Rooster Teeth who had since been let go. Um, mm -hmm. And later on by, I believe, some people internally as well. Yes, yes, it was eventually acknowledged by the company themselves. Um, so what did this consist of? So there's a lot. Um, so this was, this information I pulled off a master post by Tumblr user Ruby Conversations, uh, no dashes or anything there. Uh, go give them a follow if you are so inclined. Um, they put together all of the Glassdoor reviews, and here were sort of the consistent themes. Um, first of all, the most of this was about like the labor standards at Rooster Teeth. Um, now, I should point out, in the animation industry. Uh, they, people, like, animators are not treated well, period, regardless of what company you work for. Um, a, like, average day, and I do have, I did talk to Pug about this since she actually works in animation. A typical day in animation is, like, 10 to 12 hours with unpaid overtime beyond that. Um, that's, like, already standard. Oof. Rooster Teeth was working people beyond that to the point where it was considered unacceptable, like, within the industry. Um, the numbers we got were 80-hour work weeks, at least one-third of which was unpaid. Um, the low pay, even by industry standards, with no possibility for any kind of, like, raises or promotions or other advancement. Um, they would frequently take on people as contract employees, which is typical in animation. Most animators, again, I checked on this, work on a project-to-project, -project, like, contract basis, which is how basically all of the film and television industry works, by the way. Um, very few people actually work for a company and stay there for, like, multiple years. Um, mm -hmm. So that's typical, but what Rooster Teeth would do is they would hire a contract employee, said, oh yeah, and if you do really well, we'll take you on full-time, and then they never took anyone on full-time. Um... And then beyond that, they had a partnership with Full Sail, uh, the, the gaming game design animation school, where they could get unpaid interns from them. And so they took on like several batches worth of unpaid interns and had them working the same hours for literally no money and promised them all jobs when they got done and then didn't give them jobs. So, uh, obviously pretty bad. Now, pretty bad. Yeah, bad, bad stuff. Now, this is not like a huge surprise to me. I don't want to say, uh, in the sense that like I've worked at a small like boutique entertainment company before, where like you know it's owned by like two dudes who are good friends, and they just sort of do whatever the fuck they want and do not listen to criticism. And this is the kind of shit that sounds exactly like what would happen if you, like, gave them a bit more money than they're used to working with, and it just spiraled out of control. So you you guys, okay, I think Merc, you were in the fandom by this point, correct? Uh, probably. It was between six and seven. Yes. 
Okay, do you guys remember when this dropped and, like, what the mood was in the fandom? Uh, I do remember. I excused myself from a lot of it. Ooh. <laughs> um, it was... I don't I mean, I think at this point, like... I don't think there was, like, a lot of debate or discourse over it. I think people were basically like, this is fucked up, and, like, Rooster Teeth needs to be held accountable. Like, I don't remember there, like, people being like, no, this can't be true. You know what I mean? Like, I remember people being like, no, this actually, like, makes sense, and this explains a lot of the issues that we know have been happening behind the scenes or, like, some of the projects, etc. I... Um, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I did see some people, like, there are definitely people around who are just like, RT can do no wrong, but, like, mm, most true. people, the general consensus was that, like, yeah, this is a big problem, because there have been plenty of reports that it was, like, a revolving glass door of animators just going in and out, and, mm -hmm. like, that's part of the reason why they didn't have a cohesive, like, animation team ever, um, and people still had to, like, learn again, like, they they brought on, like, an industry standard program, but then they were still working within the confines of the models that they made and all that other stuff, um, which they had to get used to as soon as they got brought on the animation team, and it just seemed like a really stressful work environment based on like everything that I heard. So it just seemed like you know, obviously Rooster Teeth started as a really small company, and they they don't they didn't know how to run a company like that's very obvious like they, they they had no idea what they were doing and i think their company grew so big that they just kind of like they had all, like a lot of people at the top had been working together for so long i think there was a lot of lack of communication i want to say between you know like gray got away with so much shit and like i don't know how he did it yeah <laughs> frankly because like a lot of like you know and I mean, obviously, we we can believe this, we can believe, we can not. But I I know some of the other like higher staff were like, we had had no idea this was happening because Greg was just able to sort of control his department and like you know not let what was happening I, sort of like get to other departments or whatever. I don't know. I think there was just like a lot of weird, a lot of weird internal communication shit that just was not happening, and like people were turning a blind eye, and they needed to get their projects done and didn't know how to do it any better, and like they literally. We're just totally mismanaging everything. Right. So I was thrilled that this all came to light. Yeah, this sort of ties into, because I mentioned at the beginning of this episode that we would discuss budget issues for volume five. So the reason that all of this came out was because of the production cycle for volume five of Ruby, uh, season one of Genlock, and then a few other shows, mainly Nomad of Nowhere. Um, basic Nomad of Nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> No matter, I remember that. Basically what happened was, um, so Grey Haddock, the voice of Roman Torchwick, um, at some point when Rooster Teeth got some more money, which I believe was after they were acquired by the infamous MCN full screen, fuck those guys, um, they probably had some more money to work with, and so they decided to expand their animation department. And in doing so... Uh, they started taking on a lot more projects. Now, Gray was promoted to the head of the animation department, despite never heading an animation department before, and also not really knowing what that entailed, and admitting to this openly. Um, a running theme from what I read seemed to be basically, management at Rooster Teeth is very much a boys club of all these dudes who've known each other for a really long time. And it's extremely insular. They're not going to, like, let anyone in um, if they don't have to. And it's basically, like, they, the way they describe it is they basically roll out the red carpet for quote-unquote talent. So anyone you see on screen in, like, an Achievement Hunter video or mm -hmm. whatever. Those guys are doing great. They're fine. They don't have to work 80 hours or whatever. Um, but everyone else is disposable. Um, and that's sort of how gray operated in the sense that like basically after gray was promoted he had wanted he had had the idea for genlock for a while and then once he had been promoted to head of animation he was like oh now i can make it happen but they just straight up did not have the budget to do as many shows as they were doing because they were also doing chibi on top of all of this um plus one <laughs> plus one or two others i'm probably forgetting were they doing camp camp at this point i think so I don't know. I've never heard any good things anyway. about Camp Camp, so I don't touch that. Um, so, yeah, so they had so many shows going, but they were not expanding their staff to match that because they didn't have the budget for that. 
they were just spreading themselves ridiculously thin, um, which is why everyone was so goddamn overworked. And part of that is like a cultural thing. Um, someone said that like Rooster Teeth just has a culture of doing this in the sense that like Miles and Carrie have talked about like um, getting a hotel room next to the office so they don't have to go home every night so they can just like be working all the time. Uh, and, like, Monty very infamously would work himself, like, nonstop for, like, three days until, like, his body collapsed. And, uh, Shane tried doing that and then lost his wife and his job, in part because mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. So, this is just, like, how they operate, and they kind of expect everyone else to get on board with it, even if, you know, they're not doing that anymore, because, like, they, they figured their system out, but, like, you know, we did, we sort of did our time as management doing these ridiculous long weeks, now you have to, too, or at least that's how, I imagine that's how they justified it to themselves. That's pretty unfair, and unfortunately very common, that it's three people who think it's a passion project for me, so obviously it is for everybody on the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It also does, yeah, that's totally true. also does not help that uh, working at Rooster Teeth for a lot of people is a dream job, and I am like, oh god, y you can't trust people who, like, how do I put this? You have to be wary of any job where the, the pitch is that you're doing what you love, mm -hmm. because they will take advantage of you, and they will milk you for all you are worth, because they know that you'll put up with a lot of bullshit because you are quote-unquote doing what you love. That's kind and of. I think that's like that's like really what that's the thing that was like that's what Rooster Teeth was founded on. Like it literally was like I would say until they were bought out, even when they started getting bigger. Like it really was just a lot of people doing what they loved, and so they did create this unhealthy culture that actually could not, that could not actually sustain what they would become. Yeah, Does that makes sense. They couldn't be like that yeah. beyond what they were, and like this and is really didn't adapt. Yeah. Um... But basically, a lot of this was pinned on Gray specifically, even though, again, this really is, like, a whole company issue. And, like, the fact that Gray was doing all this and no one else in the company knew about it, to me, does not suggest that he was, like, doing a really good job of hiding it. It suggests that, you know, these guys are all friends, and they're all very- mm -hmm. they're buddies, and they're not going to turn on each other, even if they know someone is, you know, doing all these terrible things. Um, and then it, which is why, like, it only becomes a problem when the public finds out about it, and then he gets kicked out. Um, because if nepotism really is what was driving all of this, that would make the most sense. Yeah, um, true. But Gray sort of took the blame for all of this because one of the things he did was that he was, like, a, I think a co-director on Volume 5, that's what he was supposed to be. But then when Genlock got greenlit and they got extra funding from Michael B. Jordan to, like, actually make it happen, he just bailed on Volume 5 with, mm. like, most of his work unfinished. Uh, and so the theory goes that this caused them to be way... That plus the character shorts, which we discussed earlier, added up to them being way under budget for Volume 5, which is why a lot of shit in Volume 5 feels kind of underwhelming, because they, li like, for example, the battle at Haven may have been as shitty as it was, because it probably is a lot more, like, time and therefore money intensive to animate, like, complicated fight choreography than it is to animate, like, little fights, little skirmishes here and there, and then mostly just people talking. Mm hmm that would make sense. Um, and also why they were in, why, like, Ruby in the house is a thing. Because if you're trying to cut costs, well, just have everyone stay in one location the whole time. That's less locations you have to build. Um, and so the end result of all of this is Five had a lot of issues. Genlock did happen, and it, like, was pretty well received. But um, it didn't do, like, quite the numbers they wanted it to, I think. Um... I think Nomad of Nowhere really got screwed over because, like, they actually, like, fired... The, the guy who, like, came up with it, I think they fired over some disagreement with Grey, I want to say. And then they took it in, like, I think the creator of Nomad of Nowhere said, like, yeah, it, it's, like, a pretty good show, but it's really not what I envisioned for it. And this is, I think, a lot of why I remember going on the Reddit at the time when Genlock was being advertised, because they were really pushing Genlock. Um... The, the the talk was that, oh, Genlock is going to kill off Ruby. The idea being that 
you know, Gray, it was his, he ran anima- the animation department. He had the run of the place. He was going to divert, he was already diverting all these resources from Ruby to Genlock, and they, like, legitimately thought, like, oh, shit, this is going to be, like, their main thing now. Um... It ended up killing off everything except Ruby, is really what happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the end result of this is that, like, remember I said earlier how one of their big problems was that they would hire all of these contract workers and temps and then promise them full-time jobs and then not give them uh, full-time jobs. Well, that's why there were so many bad Glassdoor reviews coming in all at once, because they let all those people go at once and they all immediately went to went online to air their grievances. Mm. I don't, and so after those came out, they fired Gray, they hired, I think, extra, they hired, I think, two new writers for Ruby, um, they hired, like, more staff in general, they had, like, someone come in to, like, bring them up to animation industry standards, so I think all of their employees, all of their animators are now contract-based, but, like, you know you're contract-based, and you're not being, like, strung along, basically. So, obviously, now... I, I got an Anon a while ago from someone who said that they were a Rooster Teeth employee or a former Rooster Teeth employee. Uh, and they had some additional allegations uh, that they said, like, you know, the Glassdoor reviews were only sort of scratching the surface of how bad this place is. Um, because it's just, like, one Anon and I don't really feel qualified to, like, follow up on all that, if that makes sense. I don't want to, like, throw around additional accusations that i can't actually source here yeah i was gonna say um but would i be surprised if another big sort of like drop comes out where we find out that like even more abuse has been happening behind the scenes no i would not be surprised at all hey everybody this is max in post-production just wanted to let you know that this episode was recorded about a week and a half before rooster teeth fired two prominent members of the achievement hunter cast for sexual misconduct at least one of whom was sending nudes to minors uh just wanted to point that out in case this seems like something that should have come up during the podcast, uh, although it is not a labor issue, it is just sort of a general rooster teeth scandal and an example of how this company, once again, is the bad place. Um, just wanted to throw that out there in case anyone was wondering why it did not come up during this discussion. Anyway, back to the show. I think it will depend on how much they have learned from everything that has gone on. I mean, they had the whole thing with racism recently of, of their employees and like, I would, I would like to hope that at some point they, they realize that they are, I mean, it's different in the way that like Rooster Teeth is a company that is publicly held accountable more so than any other company that I'm familiar with because they are so heavily audience grown in ways that like, like this is like, we literally, I mean, they have grown because their audience has grown and that is it. Like it's, we're there for them basically, you know, like. It I feels more personal. It's more personal. And because that's how they position themselves. They're like, you know us, you know our talent, you know our voice actors, you see them, you hang out with them every day. Like, well, well, like that's kind of how they position themselves as a company. Um, And so I would hope that at a point they would realize that they cannot keep doing shit to their employees because they are so publicly held accountable that this shit's just going to keep happening. So like, you know, you hope that they are going to learn at some point that maybe they will address these issues and they will learn how to manage themselves as a company and their departments and etc so i would hope that after everything that's happened recently that they've internally gotten their shit together who knows if that is true or not but that is just my i'm, I'm just like i'm taylor swift in the you belong with me music video holding up the sign that says tired of drama <laughs> <laughs> jesus christ um yeah all right i think that's a pretty good summation of what was going on behind the scenes between five and six um yeah, like I said, they've hired some consultants since then. They've shifted a bunch of stuff around. Hopefully they have improved, but um, I don't know. I'm not holding my breath. All right. Because this is sort of a downer, I wanted to end this episode on a high note, on something fun, something light, something we can all enjoy, and that is hiatus content. Oh, no. no. What have we done? Is that why I'm here? <laughs> yes. Wish. This is our oh. server, Wish. <laughs> so, for those of you who weren't watching the show live, um, hiatus content is the glorious <laughs> result of people having so much 
energy and hype and just like, you know, they've got a lot of feelings about the show and nowhere to put them because you have to wait another year for content. And so shit posting reaches an all time high during the hiatus. Um, and there was a lot of it uh, between six and seven. I was not there for previous hiatuses. Um, was was si- was six and seven like particularly batshit? Would you guys say? Yes. yes. It was insane. What was between three and four? That must have been bad shit. No. No. That was Not just, like, nearly. sad. Oh. <laughs> Everybody was depressed. It was just bummed out. <laughs> nearly a was just bummed out. Yeah. yeah. No, six but and seven was six, bad Six shit. ended on such a triumphant note, right? So everyone's all full of energy and all the strings. Shit. Yeah, we had like, so much adrenaline that it just First, could not be contained. we're high right into hell. Exactly. Yeah, I know. Um, Bringing us yours. Okay, let's start with, like, the stuff that isn't as that you guys aren't going to groan at as much, um, which is the volume seven speculation. We talked about the Atlas ball before. Oh, the Atlas ball that never yeah, was. I still yeah. rooting for it. It's not going to happen. <laughs> when? Time for a ball. Not so close. End of volume eight, they have a, a hero's ball in the abandoned Atlas Academy, and it's like someone plays oh, violin. Incredible. And yeah, there we go. There Breaking it is. There it like, is. They have this dance, and they just dance by themselves while, like, Perfect. Ren plays the violin. That's incredible. <laughs> that's, 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 yeah. it. that's it, folks. Yeah, there you go. You're welcome, guys. That's my yep. speculation. Yeah, we talked a bit about that before, about how, like, I think people were just like, oh, Atlas is the fancy place, so they gotta they gotta get their fancy clothes on and go to a dance. Um, oh, that's exactly Aaron what it was. The fancy place. Yeah. Oh, right. Aaron, Ze- yeah, Aaron Zek tweeted a bunch of emojis for like what's gonna happen in seven, and there was a dancing emoji. Oh, Who said yeah, Atlas ball yeah, before that. that? Everyone was more just like, obviously, that's what it means. Like, uh-huh. we all were primed for it, right? Yeah, no, we were like the minute they were like going to Atlas, we were like, Atlas ball time, it's over. Yeah, it was awesome. And then, yeah, and the emojis sealed the deal. Exactly. Yeah, yeah there yeah, was, was the club scene, I guess, right? Tremendous amount of like art and fanfic and just pretty some some very high quality content came from that, I gotta say. Um another sort of wacky thing to come from volume seven speculation is the idea of a shopping montage. Oh, I was so yeah, looking forward to that. that. Okay, how did anyone so think bad. this would happen? Well, I read yeah. a fanfic that really strongly affected me forever. Uh, Skewed by lakes and seas. There's a really good shopping montage in that mm-hmm. thing. That's and true. I was like, that has to happen. That has to happen. So. That's true. You're right. Skewed by lakes and seas. That's yeah, by, by big, yeah, that's a good She's, shopping montage. Listening behind mm-hmm. me. I'm just, good. I'm just imagining <laughs> like uh, Blake vacuum sealing her titties into different cat suits, and the other girls like shaking their heads. <laughs> yeah, he's like, they all look good. Mm-hmm. I think because we knew they were going to have new outfits in volume seven. Yeah, right? no, that was really so. it. Is we were like, we know they're going to have new outfits. We assumed Blake was going to cut her hair. So we were like, let's see them shopping. Like, let's just see it. Did we assume Blake was going to cut her hair? Or was it like someone should? No, we hair? assumed. I think we figured, like, I, I didn't want it to be true. But everybody was kind of like, I bet Blake will cut her hair. Yeah. But a lot of people were like, that could never happen because they like Blake's hair. I, I was in denial. I just, I love her <laughs> coat with long haired look. It was so good. Yeah, it was. It was a good look. It was very good. I appreciate the bob, though. I'm a big, I'm a big fan. I mean, I'm excited now that they they made it fluffier. I think they have made it fluffier. No, they have. They confirmed it. I see people yeah. talking about the fluffy hair all the time on Twitter. Yeah. It's because it was like too flat and seven, and now they've like really, they're like, we heard your complaints and we <laughs> fixed it. It kind of oh, looks like fat yarn sometimes. Dude, when will they address our complaints about the girls not having any muscle? That they, they did. They did. They did. They did. They did. Yeah. Recently. They did. They said vacuo. Oh we man. Some guns for Yang. Did they have to do it like gradually to like not like just suddenly have muscles? Every one single day? episode, Yang's muscles increase just slightly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is what happens. I want a flip book after the volume. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> One second from every episode. Yeah, just get as many like matched shots as you can. It's a uh, it's himbofication. Just get buffer <laughs> and buffer as time goes on. Uh, it's dimbo vacation. D- dimbo. It's dimbo dyke. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I gotcha. Yeah, we've invented this. Yeah, we coined it. I've seen a few different like um variations on like what 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 what's like a female himbo but not a bimbo. Um, well, this that one one's is good for enough. Dyke bimbos. Gotcha. Yeah, it's like, so, a, which of Yang is definitely a jimbo, though. Absolutely. Uh, no, I mean, she's too smart. smart. She's too smart, yeah. honestly, but <laughs> it's just for fun. But I think she's someone who's like 
can have really dimbo acts though like obviously she's smart but sometimes she's real dumb but sometimes she's like let's arm wrestle bitch yeah exactly yeah so yeah <laughs> On its, I have a whole rant about the term himbo and it being like ridiculously overused. But um, oh well, it is. It's a meme. Yeah, yeah. It's, been, it's been taken down. Yeah, but it's whatever. In the trash heap with tender now. Oh god, <laughs> <laughs> tender yearning. There's so so many. Um. Okay. I bring no words back though. <laughs> What's back? No, no. Bring tender back. <laughs> I still Ooh, like tender. I still use it all the time. But. All right. Margaret would be like Brie Tender back. Um, I feel like, okay, I don't know if this is just like the people I was following at the time. I feel like there was an uptick in like ridiculous crack fic. Yeah. Like the soap one, the Yang. Uh, the there was one with like a milk. Milk. Yes, yes. Okay, turning yeah. Yang into various objects. Oh, yeah, that I don't even was know that was spin off of yours. Everyone just ran with yours. Okay, yeah, let's, were. let's. Everyone like wants to be thing. next yours. All right. Trying to make happen you can't it, it's like it's you fetch can't yours you can't make yours happen <laughs> well you can't make another yours happen is what you can't do um okay people keep trying to repeat it but it ain't gonna work all right let's let's back up a bit wish oh no would you like to <laughs> explain to the class and by the class i mean the audience what is yours okay so it was okay people blame me for this but it wasn't actually me <laughs> you're, it wasn't you're, it you're, was emily and yoda you're pulling the shaggy defense here i forget exactly what happened but somehow they were making jokes and they ended up co like combining yang and horse um somebody put that in my ass box and it got put into a bunch of other people's ass boxes and it just spiraled out of control after i think it was me and al that answered asks about it and mm. it, it was just, it just like originated in a server we were all in. Yeah. And it was like not a big server either, but everybody was just so fucking stupid in that server. That it was like, <laughs> we came up with the dumbest shit. And then Emily and Yoda were like, who is Secret Tunnel? Yeah, on Tumblr and Ruby Ballpoint Pen. Yes. And then they were like, it just it just went out of control. We answered like, somebody like think made something and then it just got posted and then Beha was coined. And if- Oh, I was gonna say, I thought yours was like a mutation of Beha. Yes. So if I it recall was. correctly, mm -hmm. the, the true yours origin story is that the discussion was about so people were speculating about atlas outfits that was the other thing like before because yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, we yeah. knew they'd get new outfits but they didn't reveal what they were until i think the summer of that year so there was a few months where we knew there would be new Our outfits kids. but we didn't know which ones right um and so people were like drawing up like uh you know their own uh atlas outfits that caused other people to be like ooh, like uh, they'd get new outfits for Vacuo, too. Let's draw some Vacuo outfits. And I guess a bunch of people were drawing Yang with, like, a cowboy theme mm -hmm. for Vacuo. Um, which, sure, why not? Um, I mean, Yang is a cowboy already. She's got she that in Volume 5. Per, yes, particularly in Volume 5. Um, mm -hmm. And then Cowboy led into, I guess, like, Yang plus Horse. And then that ended up with yours. I think that is how we got to that point. <laughs> it was a shit post. It definitely started as a shit post from somebody in our server. Yeah, it was. Spiral. It was us. I've got yeah. I've got yours prime. I uh, primary yourses here. It was not. It was just a. It was a it joke was a that just. It just spiraled so far, and we all tried to black it out. You really beat that dead yours. I <laughs> absolutely do. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't hope that I ASMR read the one fanfic. Uh, oh my uh, god, guys, I forgot about that which, one. Which, wait, which one was that? Oh no, did you guys not know about that? Wait, I think oh, I've- I, I actually did know about I that. Think I think I've heard this. You. There were a couple of, of uh, like, again, there was a lot of, like, goofy-ass crack fic around that time. Which one was the one you read? Uh, so there was one where <laughs> all I remember is, um, I'm not going to say who wrote it because I know who wrote it and they want to disappear into infamy with with it. But um, Oh, I think I know who you're talking about. I know what you're talking about too. Yeah, but um, it was one where like, I don't remember exactly the premise, but Yang was definitely a horse and she stomped at him with her hooves. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and I ASMR read it because somebody was just like, wish ASMR. And I was like, Yes, I will read a bad fanfic doing that. <laughs> that was such a crack period of time. Yes. It was. I, so I actually have some inside info on this because I think I know who you're talking about, Wish. Um, oh, no. 
And don't reveal, don't reveal. Well, I'm, I'm not going to say their name, but th- I talked to them about this and they basically said that they were part of uh, another, I don't think it was the server you guys are talking about. It was some, no, it was yeah. I know which was one. It one? yes, it was another server. Again, I will not say like who ran it or whatever, but it was a Ruby server. And apparently the not safe for work channel in that Ruby server was infamous because people would basically throw out ridiculous non sequiturs like yours, yeah. for example. And then someone else in the server would be like, I dare you to write a fanfic about this. And then that produced some of the most ridiculous oh, nonsense you've ever seen. I am told that the, the sort of like telltale sign that a fic came from this period of time is that there's a whole bunch of Ruby fanfic that all mentions Dorito salad at one point yeah, or another. Yep. Every yep. every Dorito salad, fan, every fanfic that makes mention of Dorito salad is the same group of friends who were in this server who were all writing this bullshit at around the same time. Yep. yep. That's where we get um, Adam X Shrek. It's where I believe we get Adam X Yang's bike. <laughs> yep. Um, it's where we get uh, the, the Yours fic. It was actually, I remember that's the one that ends with... Uh, I'm not voring her, and she's not voring yes. me. We're voring each other. Oh my yeah. god! Um, it was, that's it the was one. one time and in the fandom's history. And my personal favorite, the pizza peel fic. If oh any- god! <laughs> yep. That Those two are written by the same person. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, truly, I understand why they want to distance themselves from this. But um, honestly, literary genius. Uh, the, the pinnacle of this fandom's shit posting capabilities. Um, I know. The lot. It, it was stark. The line. Was such a huge like flood of like amazing fan fiction in those months too, though. Like, then we had yeah. Yeah, that's when I started writing. I was about I to know, say. I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a very good period for it. But it was like, like it was like the best of times and the worst of times. <laughs> well, that was the thing. Every everyone just had the juice, you know. And so the people who were doing like really because there was also a lot of like amazing fan art that came out of the aftermath of uh, like bees kill Adam and everything. Um, sure. So you really had like yeah, like you said, it was like all of the people who were doing like really amazing fan art. And, you know, uh, really, like, great, well-thought-out fan fiction were all at the, like, the top of their game. And then simultaneously, the people producing cursed content were, like, at the same kind of peak. Um, it's a very high energy time. So you really got... also when we started Fandom Hunger Games, which Yang won the first oh, time. Incredible. A classic. <laughs> that was so funny. But yeah, Fandom Yang Hunger won was everything. But yeah, you really every single time the first round. <laughs> Wait, <you laughs> both both years you died in the first round. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's sad. Yeah. F in the chat next for year, wish. Next year's your next wish. Year. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna take it next year. Wish you're gonna win. Yeah. So anyway, best of times, worst of times. Just just an excellent hiatus. Um, last thing I want to say because. I was trying to say about the pizza peel fic. The line from that that gets me to this day is, um, I think it was, damn Yang, your ass is paler than your mother. (laughs) (laughs) Jeez. Please, enough. Cracks me up every fucking time. I should link that. It's, um, it's, it's, I think it's orphaned now on AO3, so you can read it without knowing who wrote it. Yeah, so I'll, I'll drop that in the description if anyone is curious. All right, let's wrap this up. Final thoughts, uh, Merc. Volume six, best of times. I don't know. What else can we say? <laughs> no. There's nothing else I can say. Uh, Margaret. It was V six, best volume, and that was it. Wish. Uh, this is my like top, one of my top favorite volumes. I absolutely loved it, and I can't really think of too many flaws with it. So yeah, one of my favorite volumes. Aaron. Oh, best of all time. Just so good, so gay, so validating, everything I ever wanted. Excellent. And uh, as I mentioned before, this is probably my favorite volume as well, except maybe volume seven, which we will get into on the next episode. Thank you everyone so much for listening and or watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope this episode wasn't uh, too um, tilting to any non-Bumblebee shippers out there. But you know what? I knew I was going to do this eventually, and it was gonna. if it's going to happen in any volume, it's going to be in six, you know? This was the time for it. 
All right. I guess we will see you all later. Everyone say bye. 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 Bye.